<laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all to the Christmas meeting of the British Astronomical Association. Welcome to all those here in the lecture theatre of the Institute of Physics near King's Cross Station in London. And welcome to our viewers on our uh, YouTube live stream. Uh, this is uh, our, our biggest event, I think, since um, our biggest event in terms of attendance since the COVID lockdown. Uh, we have had about uh, 90 people booked today, and uh, we've got some excellent speakers for you today. Although we do have a change of program, uh, the, the advertised uh, First uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Mackay, uh, couldn't uh, was ill actually, so we hope to give you his talk on the uh, controversies in astronomy some other time. But um, luckily, uh, uh, one of my colleagues on the BAA Council, Tim Parsons, has stepped in and will give us a, a talk on a completely different subject, but it, it will um, it, it should um, fit in nicely. Uh, so, first of all, it is uh, one of my measurable duties to welcome any new members. Uh, traditionally, if there are any new members attending a <coughs> BAA meeting for the first time, they get welcomed by the president, but they have to volunteer themselves. <laughs> hand up, stand up and tell us who they are. So, would anybody like to volunteer to be welcomed? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> I'm uh, John Archer from uh, Crayford, probably the worst astronomer in the group, and uh, uh, for, my, for my sins, the current chair, so thank you for Thank you. Well, it's lovely to have you, John, and I uh, hope, hope you uh, have um, many uh, happy, uh, happy times with us. Uh, so, uh, I need to tell you about the papers that have been approved for the BAA Journal. Uh, by the council today, and that is done by the paper secretary, Jeremy Shears, who will uh, appraise you of that now. Thank you, David. So at our meeting this morning, council approved the publication of two papers. Um, the first is the tortuous discovery of the Gegenschein full zodiacal light and zodiacal band, Rawlinson versus Jones, so another controversy in the world. Uh, and that's by uh, Marinus uh, van der Slice. And the second one that was accepted is Evidence of Abrupt Changes in the Orbital Periods of Two Cataclysmic Variables by David Boyd. Thank you, Jeremy. You just have to do that in case you object. You, you're actually entitled. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, we accept the paper's secretary's recommendation, but it can be a bit controversial, what, what we accept and what we accept. In theory, you, you have a say on it. So I'm not going to dwell on that. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you about the, what the next BAA events are. Uh, immediately after this event, we're having a Christmas social gathering, which has been kindly organised by uh, Mary Lou Louise Archer in the Astronomer Pub. Uh, but you have to uh, have, have uh, pre-booked the ticket for this because there's only 40 places. Right and they've all gone. Uh, so yeah, people were asked to book to Eventbrite for that. And um, Mary Louise has made some little maps which we'll be giving out to show you how to get to this astronomer pub, which I've never been to either. But hopefully we'll, we'll all be uh, able to find that. And that'll be immediately after this meeting. Uh, the next meeting, formal meeting that we hold here, will be on Saturday, the 21st of January, 2023. Uh, and uh, in that meeting, we will have a, a talk about um, the James Webb, using the James Webb Space Telescope to find uh, distant galaxies. And we'll have a talk about um, uh, Venus from uh, Javier Peralta. And, uh, We've also got uh, some webinars coming up in the new year. We've got a solar section webinar, which is on Saturday, the 18th of February. That's all afternoon, and uh, that'll be online. And uh, in March, uh, on uh, Wednesday, the 1st of March, we'll have a, a, a webinar about uh, uh, analysis of Jupiter's atmosphere. 
organised by the Jupiter section, and you can uh, find that, find all the details of those, obviously, on the BAA website. I will move on to our awards. It's one of the, oh, it has been, since its foundation, one of the major functions of the BAA has been to recognise outstanding work in amateur astronomy and to give that recognition and to hand out medals and prizes. Sometimes they're, they're money prizes, sometimes they're book tokens, sometimes they're medals. And I have quite a few medals to give out today because some of these medals were awarded during the lockdown period and the recipients have never been able to come here to get ceremonially presented by the, the president. So first of all, I will uh, tell you about Bill Leatherbarrow. Uh, Bill Leatherbarrow was nominated in 2020 for the Goodacre Medal, which is the senior and most prestigious medal of the association, uh, which is awarded for significant contribution to astronomy, generally for a lifetime's work. Uh, he, uh, Bill, joined the BAA in 1965. He's been contributing to the lunar and planetary sections ever since. He administered helped to administer the Mercury and Venus section in the past, and he became director of the lunar section in 2009. He led that with great distinction and uh, energy until last year uh, when health problems uh, forced him to give that up. He was always known for his encouragement of new observers, and um, he was president 2011 to 13, and <coughs> he was uh, always... Uh, so friendly, readily approachable president, uh, and uh, he started many new positive developments within the BA. So, uh, Bill, where are you? Yeah. Please. Uh, 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 please accept the Good Acre Medal of the BAA. And uh, thank you very much for so many decades' service to the association. Would you like to say a few words? A, a few interesting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, this means an enormous amount to me. Um, I'm aware of the fact that uh, this award has gone to so many of the giants of British amateur astronomy over, over many, many years, and I feel very proud and rather amused to find myself in their company, although certainly not in their league. Um, I'm very, very grateful to the President and to the Council for uh, deeming me worthy of this award. Um, I'm even more grateful to my wife, Vivian, who's put up with a house full of telescopes <laughs> um, and, and unsociable hours of observing. But I think above everything, I'm grateful to the, the BAA itself, which over many, many years has provided me and many, many others with, with so much in the way of support and encouragement. Um, it's a fabulous organization that I feel very proud to belong to, and um, long, may it, long may it continue. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> In 2020, a council decided to award the Goodacre Medal twice, not having awarded it for several years. We don't award it every year, so um, it, it, it really is a sought-after thing. And in 2020, also, Gary Poyner was nominated for the Goodacre Medal by Jeremy Shears, Roger Pickard, and David Boyd. Uh, Gary has, again, a lifetime's achievement in astronomy. He started observing in 1965. Uh, he's concentrated on variable stars, and he has made in excess of 300,000 visual magnitude estimates, 
which uh, may be a world record. <laughs> Uh, he was the director of the BAA Variable Star section from 1995 to 2000, uh, and uh, also for many years he was responsible for the Variable Star pages in the Astronomer magazine. Uh, he's still active, very active in the Variable Star section today. Uh, he has more jobs than I can mention. He's an expert in cataclysmic variables. He works with professionals. Uh, 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 on projects to try and understand the behavior of these stars, and uh, he coordinates observational campaigns between amateurs and professionals on, on the cataclysmic variables. And he's really, he's given many talks to the BAA, and he's one of those people who really knows his stuff, basically. So thank you very much. Scary, come up and uh, let's try and. <laughs> So, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and uh, the Council for um, awarding me this medal. Um, Bill has actually stolen my speech. I wonder what he was doing <laughs> with his hands in my pocket earlier, because everything Bill has said, I wanted to say. Um, so, um, I'll say, say this very quickly, that for the last 50 odd years, variable stars and the BAA have been my life, really. Um, you, you've only got to ask my wife that. And uh, if anybody deserves a medal, I think she probably, like you, deserves the medal more than me. Um, so um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, at the Council for allowing me to for the Good Acre Medal. And I'd certainly like to thank you for finally getting the presentation. I've had two years to get over the shock. But, but the, thrill, the thrill of actually winning this medal will last me for the rest of my life. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Another award, but one which is not awarded very frequently, is called the Horace Dahl Medal and Gift. And we've decided uh, this year to award this to a computer expert, a computer programmer. Dominic Ford has been a member of the BAA for many years. Uh, he's been webmaster of the BAA. He designed uh, earlier versions of the BAA website. Uh, the BAA image library, which members use every day on the website, was created by him, and it, it uh, is an extremely clever thing, uh, uh, as you'll discover. It, it, it will actually um, determine which area of the sky your observation was taken. It will do what we call plate solving. And Dominic has provided this software, world-leading software, to the BAA free, free of charge with uh, perpetual right of use license. Dominic created another website called inthesky.org, which is a free service to all, providing a list of upcoming astronomical interests in the sky and planetarium view of the sky. Uh, and uh, the observing calendar on the BAE website, that is drawn from Dominic's uh, In the Sky website. Uh, he's uh, take part, taken part in, he's developed other projects. He's got a thing called High Gazing, which is a project to triangulate the trajectories of meteors and other objects. Uh, he's got another site called hilltopviews.org.uk, which is an interactive terrain map of the Earth and the Moon. Uh, and he's been important in the BAA in maintaining our technical infrastructure over many years. And he's always ready to provide help and advice uh, and assistance in anything uh, to do with uh, website uh, uh, implementation. Uh, the Horace Dahl Medal was originally conceived of as being a medal for the builders of astronomical in instruments. Uh, Horace Dahl, of course, was a famous telescope maker, a famous op optician uh, and inventor of the, the, the Dahl Cotton Cassegrain hydro telescope. But we consider that um, a modern equivalent of this is Dominic's development of software tools uh, for astronomers. And we think he's a worthy recipient of the Horace Dahl Medal. So Dominic, please come 
and uh, receive our medal. Thank you very much for the kind words, Mr. President, and thank you to Council for, for making this award. It's, it's a huge honour, especially looking at the, the people who previously received the BAA awards um, to receive this. Um, I would say that working on the BAA website has been a huge amount of fun, and one of the reasons why it's been a huge amount of fun is because of the really amazing contributions we get. Um, both from the Office of the, the Association, who write wonderful articles, but also the images that, that BA members upload to their image galleries. I mean, I'm always blown away by what people manage to observe. Um, and it's not just people like Damien Peach who go off to Barbados and come back with images of Jupiter that you can produce for HSP images. It, it's, it's also the, the, the beginners, um, just, just to see what people are going out there and, and observing. And it's wonderful that on the BA website that's being recorded in an archive so that in future years people can, can look back on what we were doing in 2022. So thank you for the award, but also thank you to all of you for your really wonderful contributions to the site. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. All right, there's more. There's more. Yes, the, the Sir Patrick Moore Prize can be awarded for various things. We award this prize annually, and one of the things that it can be awarded for is a collaborative research project between amateurs and professionals. And this year, for the first time, we are awarding it to a team of amateurs who have been working with professionals. We are awarding it to the team of Martin Crow, Simon Dawes, and Adrian Jones for their work in the ExoClock project. The ExoClock project uh, supports the targeting of exoplanet targets for the Aerial Space Telescope. Uh, which is going to be launched in 2029. And it keeps these, uh, these observations uh, up to date. So uh, when the satellite goes up there, it will have uh, ac accurate ephemeris. Mm. Uh, the team, uh, this team, has made 255 sets of transit observations, and they published them. Uh, and... Uh, for Martin, the, the project was also made, been made possible after he got a grant from the BAA, a Ridley grant, to enable him to purchase a new CCD camera. So I think all three of them are here, Martin, Simon, and Adrian, and I have certificates for you. So uh, Martin, Simon, and Adrian, come up all together. Thank you very much. This is really uh, lovely to be recognised for this um, 
of contribution to this project. The Exaport project has been a fantastic opportunity for amateurs to make a really quite a serious contribution to a proper scientific project. And I'd encourage any of you who are keen imagers or doing any of that sort of work to consider turning your hand to doing a bit of science because this is a project where you can really add some value. That's a project that's being managed incredibly well for the observers, as I'm sure the other two will agree. We're well looked after. The information that we're producing, the observations that we're making, are all being used. They don't disappear into a black hole. That sometimes happens in these sorts of projects. So um, we all feel that we're, we're doing something valuable and get a great deal of satisfaction out of it. So it's very nice to, to be to be selected and recognised for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Simon and Adrian. Let's take a photograph of the couple together. Work is easy. Maybe wider angle lens. Yeah. Cicely Botley uh, died in 1992. She was a, a much-liked, much-loved member of the BAA, and she was very well known for her erudite contributions to the journal. And in 1992, the Council of the BAA announced that there would be a Cicely Botley Prize uh, for the best contribution to one of the association's publications. And thereafter, nothing was heard about it, and this prize was never awarded. Uh, research done by um, Martin Mobley into the life of Cicely Botley Prize brought this facts to life, and Council this year decided that we would actually award the Cicely Botley Prize. And we've decided to award the prize, which incidentally is a £100 book token, this year to John Simpson for his series of journal papers on historic observations of sunspots and aurorae. And his proposals were Mike Frost and Bill Barton of the historical section. And they said that these papers will be regarded as important source material for future researchers and their significant contribution to the journal. So uh, John is living in France. He can't be with us today, but here he is on the Zoom link. So perhaps uh, John will be able to say a few words to us. John. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? We can. Good. <laughs> thank you, and thanks to all the people who've commented on my papers and encouraged me to keep going, um, especially uh, thanks to my wife. The, the last three papers were very long, and I'm really grateful to the referee 
uh, Dr. David Willis at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory for his diligence in, in going through the papers and to Philip Jennings, who had the unenviable task of editing them and especially um, checking through more than 600 references. Um, if I may, I'd like to say a couple of words about Cecily Botley. Yes. Um, I came across her work in the 1960s when I saw her first book, uh, it's called The Air and Its Mysteries, uh, listed as a reference. It was published in 1938 when she was already a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society, um, and it was priced at eight shillings and sixpence. Um, here it is. Her second book, um, which she published herself, was called Polar Nights in 1947, priced just three shillings post free. And here it is. Amazing. Um, the copy that I've got is originally from her local library in Tun Tunbridge Wells and contains a typed list of corrections that she added in 1954. Anyhow, in, in my papers, I've cited both of these books and several of, of her uh, papers. And you could say, I suppose, that I'm quite a devotee of her work. So I'm honored and absolutely delighted um, to be given the Cecily Botley Prize. Thank you all so much. And we've sent John's certificate to him there in France. So thank you very much. It's great that you could join us. And, and thanks to the technical thank team here for facilitating that. Thank you. So we will come on to our, our main, the first of our main talks for today. As I said, uh, we uh, threw Tim Parsons into this uh, just yesterday, uh, but uh, he's, uh, he's a, a very well-known figure to many of us. Uh, he's had a career as, as a solicitor for 30 years, uh, but more recently he did the UCL Certificate of Higher Education in Astronomy, and then he did his graduate certificate in mathematics at Birkbeck, University of London, and then an MSc in astrophysics at UCL. He's now a postgraduate student. It says mature age postgraduate student. <laughs> what does it matter? What, what does the age matter? He's a postgraduate student in, in astrophysics at UCL. He's been doing that for a couple of years now. He's working on the structure of stellar winds of B supergiant stars, pr primarily in the Magellanic Cloud. Uh, in addition to that, he's a, a teaching assistant uh, and a tour guide at the University College London Observatory in Mill Hill. He's also a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society uh, and the British Interplanetary Society, and he is a trustee of the British Astronomical Association, where he, he works very hard uh, for us on our administrative matters. So he's going to talk to us today uh, uh, about a massive star menagerie touring through the upper reaches of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Tim Parsons. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, slightly interesting experience being up here. I've sat at many meetings of this association. I think I've been a member for about 25 years now. Um, I never thought I'd actually uh, be standing up here speaking, let alone of the Christmas lecture. Um, I think David gave me um, not enough notice to be able to panic about it, not enough notice to say no. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's hope this works. Um, I actually have to blame one of his colleagues from WOLAS who... Um, came to a version of this talk I gave at UCL on Wednesday, and um, uh, I think that's how I've ended up uh, here uh, today. Um, I am definitely a mature age student. I think I uh, qualify as the oldest PhD student in the astrophysics department, so uh, not the oldest they've ever had, though. 
Um, but uh, the BAA has been a big part of encouraging me to go back and study what I really wanted to do in the first place after many years in another career. So, um, yes, I think you were expecting to hear about astronomical controversies. So uh, what you might have is a controversy after this as to whether Parsons should ever be let out in public again. <laughs> we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Let's hope this works. Um, why this? Well, uh, as David said, the um, area that I'm looking at uh, for my PhD research uh, revolves around, um, literally, uh, be supergiant stars. And um, I found myself thinking, when we're all introduced to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, um, we tend to learn the basics of it. We tend to learn about colors of stars, temperatures. Most of us, I trust all of us here, have heard of main sequence stars. And most of us have heard of uh, red giants and red supergiants. You know, what happens to stars towards the ends of their lives? Um, but when you start to hear about all sorts of other crazy, large, and exotic objects, like blue supergiants and yellow hypergiants and wolf Rayet stars, slash stars, all sorts of things like that. What on earth are they? And how do they relate to each other? Um, so I thought that I would try, and it is going to be a bit of a tour and bouncing around all over the place, uh, but hopefully it will make some kind of coherent sense as we go through. So let's just see if this works now. It does, right. Um, so let's start with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Independently, thought of as probably the single most useful tool in stellar physics by the great uh, physicists Einar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell, it, independently, around about 1911. I particularly like this example that I've chosen because um, it gives us two clear and basic aspects of classification. Most of us, I trust, um, are familiar with the basic sequence of... Let me, the basic sequence of colors and how they relate to temperatures. So from the hottest to the coolest, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And I think we've probably all come across that at various times. And the HR diagram, in its most basic form, plots that against the luminosity, the intrinsic luminosity of the stars. We can add color, and we can add absolute magnitude as a measure of intrinsic luminosity. Um, but what I want you to concentrate on, particularly for this, are these series of magenta colored lines here. And this is luminosity classification. And it's very, very important because, of course, you can have a star that's way down here, an M dwarf star, but you can also, and it's red, but you can have a red star that's up here, or you can have a red star that's way up here. And what is the difference between them? It's their size, basically. So we're going to concentrate very much up here, the really exciting end. These end dwarfs down here, they sit there, they burn hydrogen really, really slowly, they carry on doing it. Unless they've been eaten by something else, every single red dwarf star ever formed in the history of the universe is still there, just chewing slowly through its hydrogen in its core. So we won't talk about those. We'll talk about things that kind of change and do a bit more over time. Like everything in astronomy and astrophysics, we come up with a classification, one, two, three, four, five, and then we find things that don't fit our classification. So we have to add and squeeze things in at the ends. And so what have we done as we found the need to classify the largest stars? We actually now, instead of just one, we have one B. In between, we have one, a, one AB, which is not shown there, one A, and above that, one A plus, the hypergiants. Sometimes zero, I don't like zero, it's, it's, it's not good in classifications. Um, one A plus, we'll call them. So let's have a look at some of these type one stars. Let's think first thing, what do we, oh, I wanted to say too, at the beginning, this image that turns up here. Um, in the room on Wednesday, I don't think anyone knew where that was. I would expect at least half of you in this room to know where that is, um, but we'll come to it in a minute. Um, what do we mean by size? Do we mean mass? Do we mean radius? Um, it can be all of those things, as I've just mentioned. But when we talk specifically about massive stars, we're talking about stars which begin their life on the main sequence with at least eight solar masses of mass. It makes them and their subsequent evolution fundamentally different to stars below that mass. 
They're characterized by brief lifetimes. Things happen fast with these stars. You can have, uh, you're probably all aware, you know, the sun's main sequence lifetime, around about 10 billion years, and we're about halfway through it. These stars we're talking in sometimes a few million years. Things happen very rapidly. Critically, extended nucleosynthesis within the stars. This is where we get the heavier elements from. If we think about the composition of the universe today, we think about the fact that there are planets in the universe, the fact that we are here, all of these things can only have come about because the elements from which they're made have been synthesized within massive stars in previous generations. And again, the fact that the lifetimes are so short means there have been many generations of these stars. These stars are critical in cosmic evolution, in galactic evolution. One thing to remember is that they're very, very, very rare. The stellar initial mass function, which Edwin Solfater in 1955 first came up with, describes the distribution of masses of stars. It's very easy to form small stars. It's very difficult to form massive stars. And in fact, we really don't know exactly how the last stages of formation of massive stars takes place. It's actually quite difficult to conceive of a collapsing cloud forming an extremely massive star without the star first switching on and clearing the environment around itself. So there's a lot we still need to learn about that process. Notwithstanding their rarity, they're what we see in the night sky. If you look up into the sky, how many M dwarf stars do you see when you look into the sky? None with your own eyes. You might see, I mean, the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri, is an M dwarf. It's not exactly the brightest object in the night sky. So despite their rarity, um, they're the massive stars are actually the stars that we're familiar with. Their fate is pretty dramatic. In almost all cases, they will end in one of the many forms of core collapse supernova. There are some exceptions to that, which we'll touch on briefly. And as I've said, they're absolutely essential in the processes of synthesizing heavier elements. Does massive mean hot? Well, no, it doesn't. Red supergiants are very cool stars, but they're extremely large, and therefore we see them easily. We'll come on to a couple of famous examples that we all know well. Um, so I just set out very, very briefly here the menagerie, as I call it. Um, what sorts of massive stars have we got? We do actually have some main sequence stars which exhibit features of um, evolved massive stars, and we'll come to that. Um, as I mentioned, basically, we're talking here about stars which, on the main sequence, have greater than eight solar masses. Red supergiants. I hope we're all, at least to some degree, familiar with those. But what about yellow supergiants and hypergiants? Blue supergiants, where do they come from? Luminous blue variable stars, wolf Rayo stars and striptelium stars. There are many, many others. I mean, if I put everything up there, all the different classifications, we'd be here all day and, and you'd throw me out very, very quickly. Um, but I just thought I'd touch on some of these in this talk. The key features of these stars are their high mass, their tremendous luminosity, and usually significant episodes of mass loss during their lifetimes, both on the main sequence and more particularly after the main sequence. Very strong stellar winds driven through intense radiation and other, other mechanisms as well, which also we will touch on briefly. Let's just quickly look at hydrogen core burning stars then. So if we think about that HR diagram, the upper left, the top end of the main sequence, you have, these are main sequence stars because they're still fusing hydrogen in their core. These stars are very different to a star like the sun. Um, I like to think that they're kind of in reverse. There's so much energy and radiation being produced within their cores um, that the core cannot be radiated. The only way in which the energy can escape is through convection. The radiative zone of these massive stars is much further out. Now, the sun is the other way around. The core radiates the envelope of the sun is convective, and we see that when we look at the sun and the photosphere of the sun. 
So they're quite, quite different in, uh, in the way that they behave. Within this area of uh, core, burn, core hydrogen burning stars, um, we see other oddities. You might see reference to BE stars. What are they? Well, they're massive stars on the main sequence, which are surrounded by accretion disk produced by rapid rotation. You see emission lines of hydrogen, Balma series in particular, around these. These stars are often very oblate. Um, Akonar is one of the famous examples there. Um, I've mentioned here O supergiants in inverted commas because a supergiant star, generally speaking, is not a main sequence star. It's a star that's evolved off the main sequence, as we'll see. But the very, very hottest O type stars tend into, because they're so large and their surface gravity is therefore so small, they exhibit many features in their spectra of supergiant or giant or supergiant stars. And I've just pointed out, I mean, that's very approximate, that this particular star, I think, still has the distinction of being the earliest classification star, i.e. highest up the uh, classification scale. It's, strictly speaking, an O2 five star, a main sequence star, but it has all this other strangeness in its um, uh, spectral classification because it exhibits many, many features of being a giant star, not just a main sequence star. We also see O main sequence stars which show strong emission lines again, and this strange classification here, when I first saw it, I thought, what on earth is that? WNH. These kind of sit in between a main sequence star and a Wolf Rayo star, and we'll come on to Wolf Rayo stars shortly. Um, there are distinct classes of stars that show very strange features of both, and we'll explain why. I turn first to red supergiants that we're all familiar with, and we probably all recall this little event here. Uh, one of my favorite stars to be produced. Um, it's our closest red supergiant. <coughs> we're all familiar with it in the winter sky in Orion. Um, why is it so luminous? Because it's so large, of course. Um, back in the winter of 2920, uh, I'm sure you'll recall the so-called Great Dimming, in which Orion looked very different as a constellation. It was very, very strange to look up into the night sky and see this familiar red star looking really, really dim compared to what we would expect to see. And I quite like this montage of the dimming effects. These are actually actual resolved images of the star. And it was in the news a lot, as you recall. Is it going to go supernova? Well, no. Um, was it dramatic? Well, yes, it looked it. But actually, how dramatic is it in the scheme of things? I just thought I'd put up this little diagram, which um, shows a number of significant mass loss events in in supergiant stars that we've observed over the years. Not supernovae, but major mass loss events. And have a look particularly P. Cygni 1600 and the ones labeled Eta 1890 and Eta 1843. As you're probably aware, references to Eta Carini. We will come to that. And also, have a look at 2006 DY, just there. So where might you think this great dimming of Betelgeuse fits into this scheme. Way up here? Well, actually, it's way down here. It's not particularly exciting in the scheme of things. It was about 10 to the minus 6 solar masses of material that were ejected from the star and cooled and obscured the star to some degree as we looked at it, hence the dimming. But you can see that some of the more exotic objects we have um, whoops, uh, up here are really rather more violent than that. So Betelgeuse will be with us for a while yet, but it's an it was an interesting illustration because it happened so close to us of just how um, unsteady these sorts of stars can be. I just thought I'd throw up for fun more than anything. Um, we can resolve the surfaces of some stars, and it's great that we can see these with very clever um, interferometry and uh, trickle imaging and so on. So I just thought I'd put up 
the one of the classic images of resolved images of the surface of Betelgeuse, with the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, amongst others, superimposed, just to fix in your mind the scale of this object. And I particularly like this one, Antares, Alpha Scorpius, because we see wonderful star spots on it. And we're used to explaining to the public when we speak about sunspots on the sun and how you could drop the Earth into them several times over. And that's pretty exciting and impressive if, in terms of the scale of things. But you could drop the sun numerous times into these star spots. They're so large that you can see <coughs> the variation in brightness of the star as these come into view. I just throw up this one for fun as well. I just, I've always liked this one, this, this little diagram. Many of you may have seen it before. It's the only time you'll see planets in this talk. Um, just trying to get in your mind the relative scale of things. So we start way down here with good old Mercury, and Mars, Venus, the Earth. And then we shrink the Earth down, and off we go up towards Jupiter. We shrink it down. A tiny little end dwarf. The Sun, Sirius. We shrink Sirius down. And we keep going. And we get to Antares and Betelgeuse down here. But then we keep going even further. New Cepi, DV Cepi, VY Canis Majoris. We're talking here of the order of 1,500, 1,700 times the radius of the sun. I just think this, this diagram kind of fixes that in your mind quite nicely. Let's move on higher up the temperature scale, blue supergiants. These are fun. Um, Lots happens with these very, very quickly. So we're starting with zero edge main sequence masses, generally 30 to 60 solar masses. So these are big, big stars. They're characterized by very dense winds and substantial mass loss throughout their life. Um, and winds which readily exceed the relatively low escape velocity. Remember, again, these stars are huge. So notwithstanding their mass, the surface gravity is very low. The material escapes readily, and the loss of mass is one of the critical things we need to be able to model accurately because it's fundamental to the rate and the way in which these stars evolve through their lifetime. One of the interesting characteristics of these stars is the profile that we see, particularly in the ultraviolet, and obviously this is something that has developed with um, spaceborne instrumentation and so on. In the ultraviolet, you have a number of um, resonance line profiles. So these are uh, transitions of ions to or from their ground state. They produce very distinctive profiles in the spectrum, which are driven by the wind, the stellar wind of the star. We can use the shape of this to diagnose all sorts of things that are happening there. And the form that you see in these wind-driven spectra are always, they're referred to as key signal profiles because the star key signal was the first star in which this was observed, actually in the optical. And what you have is a combination of, whoops, wrong slide, a combination of emission producing a particular fingerprint on the spectrum and absorption. And you get a trough of absorption, which is caused by the material around the star. So we assume <coughs> that the material leaves the stellar surface at effectively zero velocity and is accelerated outwards as it comes down. And this material is optically thick, it's dense. And so the absorption caused by that circumstellar material becomes steadily blue shifted further and further as the, as the photons coming towards us are absorbed at higher and higher velocities. And we can use this shape to determine the terminal velocity of the wind around here at the point at which this wind becomes optically thin. And what you get when you combine the two together is this very characteristic profile. Now just quickly, I thought I'd throw up just to prove I am doing some work. Um, the, these are some of the profiles I've been generating uh, for a paper that um, my supervisor and myself are in the process of putting together. Um, this is uh, the star AB96, which is a, a B11 star in the Small Magellanic Cloud. And 
what you see here, actually twice over on this side, these, these sort of partly overlap. That feature there is identical to that one. These features in the spectrum are caused by triply ionized silicon. And you actually get two features formed, about nine angstroms, 0 0.9 of a nanometer apart. And you can see the characteristic trough and the peak, the trough and the peak. We can measure in what we call velocity space, rather than wavelength, we turn it into velocity space by um, <coughs> the only formula I'll give you, basically velocity being the speed of light, multiplied by the change in wavelength divided by the rest wavelength of the feature. By measuring this width here, we can determine the velocity at which the wind becomes thin. And this is one of the fundamental parameters that tells us how much mass the star is losing. When we combine that information with looking at how deep this profile is, and from that working out the optical depth of the wind itself, how thick is the wind, how much material is coming out. And we can actually measure this at different velocities from the right to the left going from the surface of the star out to where the wind becomes thin. <coughs> And the little trick that we're trying with this paper that's in preparation is actually we do a model fit of both of the features separately. They're sufficiently far apart that we can model the two separately as long as the wind is not too fast. So you, if the wind's too fast, this bit contaminates that bit. But here it's nice and clean. And we can fit the blue part, the shorter wavelength, and we can fit the red part. We get two sets of optical depths, and we can compare the ratios of those. And to the extent that that ratio varies from what the laboratory tells us would happen as a fundamental mathematical physics, um, you can determine the extent to which the wind is not smooth and it has clumps. The disk of the star is partly covered by thicker material and partly uncovered. Again, this is actually one of the most difficult things to try to measure, but it's fundamental because you can imagine that if the wind is not uniform, then your estimates of the rate at which this star loses mass uh, are going to be way out. So uh, this is something that is an ongoing investigation. Hopefully we'll have a paper out um, in the first quarter of next year on it. Um, now, how do you get blue supergiants in a more general sense? Well, um, there's kind of two ways in which they can form. They could be the initial form of a star, a very massive star, leaving the main sequence and heading off, if you picture that HR diagram in your mind, you're near the top on the left, it's heading off towards the right as the star expands and begins, the surface of it begins to cool. In addition to that, you can have, as the star cools, of course, it changes color and you pass the yellow to the red supergiant phase. The stars can come back again and come back into the blue supergiant phase as the later stages of nuclear burning within the core heat up or cool down the outer layers of the star. So blue supergiants can form in a number of, number of different phases, but one of the things we found, much to our surprise, was when it was seen that um, supernova 1987A, which if you recall was um, in the large Magellanic Cloud in March 80, uh, February, March 87, very spectacular, naked eye sight. Um, when searches were done back to see well, what on earth formed that, it was found that it was a, a fairly ordinary blue supergiant star, which at the time were not thought to be capable of being in that state progenitors of supernovae, that they weren't ready to collapse. Um, so a, a lot of our ideas of when stars reach, of, of this sort reach the end of their lives had to be revised off the back of that. It was a fairly ordinary, if you can say that about any supergiant, um, B3 star. So... Um, Blue supergiants can, from that state, become core collapse supernovae. I just mentioned briefly here because we talked very, very briefly about 2006 GY. Um, massive stars may actually undergo direct collapse if they're extremely large. And if you go beyond even that scale to the theoretically larger stars possible, you get a very odd um, phenomenon called pair instability where the intensity of the radiation within the core of the star can produce 
electron positron matter antimatter antimatter pairs. When this happens to a large extent, you have a sudden loss of support within the star, outward support. And you can end up with a runaway collapse situation uh, in these larger stars, not caused by the end of nuclear burning, but simply through the lack of pressure within the star itself. We're just going to there. And again, because we're talking about a menagerie, I would thought I would throw in there, we talked about BE stars before. We also have BE square brackets E stars, supergiants in this case. Now, these are similar to the extent that they've got an accretion disk, which is causing emission in the spectrum. But we see forbidden line emission, these transitions in ionic states that shouldn't really occur, but do in certain specified circumstances. Now, to get that, you need extremely low density gas that is nevertheless still ionized. So it's a very particular feature of these. If you see B square brackets E, it's not a typo. It isn't a B E star. It's a B E forbidden line supergiant. These are exciting, luminous blue variables. Um, P Cygni, I mentioned, is sort of is the prototype in a sense. But probably the most famous one um, is Eta Carinae. I'm sure we've all heard at least something of this rather exciting star. Very, very late stage of evolution of very massive stars. And um, I, again, I particularly like, uh, whoops, uh, sorry, uh, this picture here. Um, the homunculus nebula, as many of you are probably familiar with it as. But um, what we have here is actually superimposed all sorts of wavelengths, right up to X-ray uh, uh, wavelengths around the outside, showing the effects of various eruption events, but in particular, the consequences of the great eruption of 1843. Um, this star, rather than Betelgeuse, will almost certainly be our next nearby supernova. When? Um, in the blink of an eye in, in cosmic time scales, but probably not in our own lifetime, sadly. Um, I think it's estimated that when this goes off, it will reach something like magnitude minus seven. So you'll be able to read by it at, at night. Um, it'll be pretty impressive. But what we do have is... Um, Thanks to the AABSO, and there'll be people in this room who've contributed to this one, so thank you to this light curve. Um, here is the light curve of Eta Carinae going back to about 1802. There's actually some older observations as well, but I just thought I'd put up the last 220 years. And what you see is early observations, Herschel observations here, the man, not the spacecraft. Um, the great eruption of 1843 incredibly bright, minus one. It became the second brightest star in the night sky. For quite some period of time, dims right down again, and then another outburst in 1890, very significant again. And what we see over the last 80 years is this steady increase again in its brightness. So a lot is happening there. Will we see another great eruption? Um, probably, before it actually becomes a supernova. Quite how significant and bright that will be, well, all the variable star observers amongst us will, will be very quick to tell us when things start happening. But it's, it's quite an exciting light curve, I think, that one. And obviously, as you can see, it's very intensely observed uh, and has been for some time. Um, OK, let's go on to Wolf Freo stars. So again, picture the HR diagram. We're now very much over to the left-hand side, the upper left. Um, we had a problem for a long time about how on earth do you form Wolf Rayet stars. In principle, if you have a single star, you need extreme mass loss. These stars are characterized by not having hydrogen in their spectra. You need, the, the, the thinking was that you've lost the envelope of the star, and the inner layers are, are exposed. So any hydrogen that was there is gone. To do that, you would need a lot of mass in the star to create very strong stellar winds through the radiation that the star is putting out, very fast winds, very dense, and huge amounts of mass loss. And these stars do indeed experience great, a great deal of mass loss. 
it can be an entire solar mass over a period of tens of thousands of years, which is a lot. Um, first discovered through their characteristic spectra at Paris Observatory in 1867 by Charles Wolfe and Georges Rayet. Um, now, what we see are highly ionized states of heavier elements. The envelope has been stripped. How on earth does this occur? We see stripped helium stars, as I mentioned there, at various masses, but these stars are very large. Um, I'll come on in just a second to other ways in which they form, but the basic theory was precisely as outlined, that you have a star losing vast amounts of its mass through very powerful stellar winds. We get oddities. I mentioned slash stars before, fantastic name. Um, these are basically, again, this strange, very, very upper end of the main sequence um, and evolving off the main sequence where you start to see stars that exhibit the characteristics both of, if you like, more traditional O-type hot stars, but also of wolf rayo stars. So there might be hydrogen in the spectrum. There might be far less than you would expect, but you also see emission lines, broadened emission lines, from heavier elements. We <coughs> classify wolf rayo stars basically by the predominant feature in the spectrum, so either nitrogen, carbon, oxygen. And that's basically increasing order of mass and temperature. The WO stars are the most extreme. You see very significant features of quintuply ionized oxygen there, which takes an awful lot of energy to do. Is this single star model complete? Well, the answer, I didn't ask the question, but the answer is no. Um, so let's look at one particular star. I talked about W in H stars before, and this one's a particular favorite. Uh, Paul Crowther, who used to be at UCL, is now at Sheffield, um, is probably one of the leading people in investigating this star. And I asked at the beginning if people recognized where we were, maybe by telling you where this particular star is, it might give it away. But this is 30 Doradus in the Tarantula Nebula in the LMC. Astonishingly intense area, intensely populated area of massive stars. You've got a huge number of stars in excess of 100 solar masses there. I mean, these are really at the extreme end of things. And the most extreme end of it really is R136A1. Um, it is thought to be one of the most massive stars in the present day universe. Um, by rights, it kind of shouldn't really exist. Um, it, it should sort of blow itself apart uh, because the amount of radiation it's producing. But it's in a special environment. It's in one of the magic, it's in the large Magellanic Cloud. The metallicity of that environment, the presence of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium, is much lower than here in the Milky Way. This helps the formation and the, the ability of very massive stars not to blow themselves apart. Uh, rotation can play a part as well. So the WNH star is basically, um, the WN part of the classification tells us that we see strong ionized, triply ionized nitrogen emission. But we do see hydrogen in the spectrum. Um, they're described as sort of O stars on steroids. So they come into the wolf ray A star classification scheme, but they do have some hydrogen there. They're not completely stripped. Let's zoom in on it. Putting telescopes in space was fantastic, wasn't it? We got better images than we could get ever from Earth. I mean, look at this, fantastic. Hubble Space Telescope images. But compare here with adaptive optics and modern interferometric techniques, stacking of images, um, which you're all familiar with um, uh, in, in various ways. We're now able to resolve down into really distinct images of the individual stars. Up until 1985 or thereabouts, all of this area was thought to be a single star. We're looking at an area that is about uh, half a light year across. And A1 and A3 are the particularly interesting ones. They're both W um, 
WN5H stars. A1 is the larger. And I've just put up references to a couple of papers there. The mass is coming down in, with various refined techniques of estimating, but it's still astonishingly high. It's an incredible object. Um, how long it will last? I don't know. But just in this little cluster, we've got nine stars with masses greater than 100 solar masses. So these, we really are at the extreme ends of the HR diagram here. We put it all together then. What do we take from massive stars in their evolution? Evolution and life of massive stars, first and foremost, is determined by the mass they have when they start their path on the main sequence, when they begin their life on the main sequence. We see in the top left here how some stars can very heavily lose mass. And this is where they end up, the wolf rayet zone over here. I talked about the single star model of wolf rayet stars. Um, we know that it's not enough. There are stars that form that can't be explained by mass, simple mass loss through extremely strong winds. And a key example of this is the Small Magellanic Cloud. We see Wolf Rayet stars here. If they're formed as single stars, they should come from stars over here. Extremely massive supergiant stars over here as well. But we don't see any there. So how on earth did those stars get there? Is it that they're all there now and there's none left? Well, that's pretty unlikely. You could kind of get there if you had stars that were rotating rapidly because they'd mix up inside and that would help them to lose vast amounts of mass. Um, but we don't see that, particularly in the, in the small Magellanic Cloud. So an alternative explanation is um, given by this. So here's, here's the typical path. Let me, let me turn this side. Typical evolutionary path of a 45 solar mass star off towards a blue and then a red supergiant phase. Now, if that star is on its own, that's what you would expect. If it's not, however, this is what you get. If it's got a binary companion that's close enough to it that they, in effect, evolve together. The companion can strip layers off this star. You expose the hotter core of the star much more easily, and the star evolves to the blue rather than to the red. And hey presto, we get exactly to where we need to be. If we look at these blue paths over here, we get lower mass stars, which we do see, and they're able to evolve out to here. Now, this isn't just theory. The more we observe massive stars, the more we realize, the more we see that actually they generally do form in associations, OB associations, binaries, triples, more. Um, they're not that common on their own, more so than smaller mass star, lower mass star. So let's just coming towards the conclusion, let, let's kind of get a picture in our mind of where all this goes, because I'm conscious I've kind of skated over all kinds of stars. If you think of your HR diagram, you've got a, a portion of it here. Again, remember, we're just looking at the upper end of the HR diagram here. So here's your main sequence, B stars and O stars. You can evolve towards the red supergiant phase. Most of us are familiar with that. That's one of the first things you kind of learn about the HR diagram. But when you go very far up here, you get through many more exotic phases, and stars can loop backwards and forwards between the blue and the red. You have very, very high mass stars, extremely unstable, the luminous blue variables. And you can have evolution of these very high mass stars across towards the various wolf rayet phases. I'll just throw this up very quickly, actually. It's, it's, there's not really time to talk about this. But um, I quite like this diagram because it gives you a summary of the fates of massive stars, as the heading said. It's really nice. There's, it's a long review paper by... Uh, Woosley, Hager, and Weaver, which um, is a really good read, actually. It's just a whole um, detailed background on, on the evolution of massive stars and their fates. But I just throw it up just to 
point out here that these are the sorts of very high mass regions in which you may find that a star simply collapses in on itself. You don't get a supernova remnant afterwards. Um, now, I've got two diagrams. Why? Well, here's Milky Way, solar metallicity, the kind of composition of the universe, the local universe. But this is a really interesting area. Zero or near zero metallicity, the primordial universe when everything is just hydrogen and helium. You can form truly massive stars. Look at the horizontal axis. In here, we go up to sort of 100 or so. Well, we've seen you can go beyond that um, in certain environments. But here, we're talking about a thousand or more. And the primordial universe, is, it's expected that it was populated largely by these extremely massive stars, the so-called population three stars, which lived astonishingly short lives and seeded the early universe with the beginnings of heavy remnants so that um, more evolved stars and material could form. And that's one of the big searches that's on at the moment is for evidence of these earlier stars. And the James Webb Space Telescope, it is hoped, will find that. There's been a paper out recently which kind of hints at seeing the results of the earliest supernova explosions and population three stars because of the sort of primordial chemical composition of the interstellar medium of some of the very, very distant galaxies that it's already observed. <coughs> Only hints at the moment, but um, a very interesting area to look at. We'll hear more of that. So, in conclusion, because I've probably gone on far too long, um, just remember there are many, many types of massive stars. Red supergiants are fun, um, but that's only one. When things get hotter and massive at the same time, it gets even more exciting. Some of these are simply evolutionary stages along towards others. The yellow stars we talked about tend to be evolutionary stages between the blue and the red and then back again as the stars loop through. Sometimes not. Yellow stars can become supernovae. Um, Wolf Rayet stars, um, very exotic objects which are the result of stripping of their outer envelopes. We realize now, often because they're in close binary pairs, um, these stars live very short lives. They seed the universe with the heavier chemical elements. They're fundamental <coughs> to both cosmic evolution and on a more local scale, galactic evolution. And just remember that without massive stars, None of us would be here. None of the planets would be here at all. So they're pretty important to where we come from. And I wanted to thank everyone for listening. Um, and obviously, if there's, I think we've got time for questions. Please do feel free. But just one final takeaway. Massive stars are the rock stars of the universe. They live fast, die young, usually spectacularly. A bit like this chap. And I do hope you know who Brian Jones is. He used to play in a band with Nick and Keith and Charlie and Bill, um, quite a famous band. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Tim. Well, it's really quite, quite a zoo, isn't it? And, and, uh, <laughs> That's the best way I could describe it. Yeah. You've given us a lot of information, a lot of technical terms there. Yeah, no problem. Would you like to take any questions? Or? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll throw myself open to the to the lions. Yeah, uh -huh. oh. <laughs> no equations in your slides for me to pick on. So I'll no, that was deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was one of my notes, but <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, uh, perhaps you could explain a little bit why metallicity that we inhibit stars from going supernova. Um, if uh, very very good question. So uh, if everyone heard that, um, why metallicity? Does not, uh, sorry, Paul, do, does not what, stop the formation of massive stars. Well, there's, there's two aspects there's that, and there's also why you said it stops them from blowing themselves apart. So, ah, uh, sorry, yes, um, uh, th th they can evolve larger without blowing themselves apart. Um, if you have high metal content, and remember by metals we mean anything that isn't hydrogen and helium, I should have put up the astrophysicists. Or the stellar physicist's periodic table, which <laughs> is wonderful. It's the same shape as the, as the one you're familiar with. It's just got hydrogen, helium, and metals. Um, <laughs> that's, all, that's all you need to know in the universe. That, 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 that's it. Um, you get effects um, with 
metals, um, where the, um, the atoms and the ions themselves kind of um, are driven by the radiation. So if you think uh, the larger a star becomes, the more intense the light that it's emitting, the shorter wavelengths, the higher energy that the photons that that star is putting out um, will emit. Now, if you've got a lot of, um, if I can call it contaminating material, a lot of heavy material, there, um, the photons at high energy levels will drive that material. It, it, the, the light imparts momentum to the particles. And it can draw, it literally can you know, pull the star apart. In the profiles of the winds that I put up, those two Greek diagrams, um, those are what we call line-driven winds. So the particular lines in the spectrum that you see are driving the wind. They're the, 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 the photons are, what's the best way to describe it, pushing the material away from the star. Now, if you don't have that, it's easier for more material to accrete without the star kind of pushing itself apart is the, is the simplest way I can describe it. I, I, I think that's probably the, the most basic, uh, straightforward way I could That's a good course. description. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and metallicity has um, all sorts of other consequences, if you like. But in terms of massive star evolution, the key thing is that it is easier to form very, very large stars if you don't have that contamination there because the material is less likely to be driven away by the energy that the star itself is putting out. So I hope that kind of makes sense to you. Okay. Nick, Nick, this yeah, is getting more worrying yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in a sense, yeah, um, although um, in terms of numbers of years, the time scales are actually very compressed, and that's, I think, one of the issues more for the cosmologists than me, but it, it seems that the further we look back, we still keep seeing structure. We see galaxies with stars in them. There's a very interesting question about that. Which came first, galaxies or stars? And it might seem like a silly question, but I'll leave you to think about that, because we think galaxies came before stars did. Um, it's all tied up with dark matter and structure, but um, uh, the um, so there's a very it, it, it seems to me at least that there's a very small window left. We we pretty much fix where the cosmic microwave background radiation is emitted, sort of 380,000 years after the <coughs> bang. That's probably more or less 13.8 billion years ago. <coughs> but we're seeing galaxies, and of course, there's most of you probably seen in the press, you know, all these claims about galaxies being identified in early James Webb uh, imaging um, at higher and higher redshifts, further and further back into the early universe. And it doesn't leave much time for kind of primordial things to form, if you like. Um, but these stars um, would have formed, I mean, it's theoretically possible you could form stars like this in parts of the universe today that remain very pristine. The small Magellanic Cloud is very pristine. Most dwarf galaxies are because the metals that are produced by supernova explosions tend to be driven out of those galaxies. So dwarf galaxies make great laboratories for studying analogues of the early universe for that reason. Um, but these, I, Nick, I'd be guessing the numbers, but I, I, when, when you consider that um, stars with masses of less, uh, zero age main sequence masses of sort of 30 to 40, <coughs> live lives measured in millions, a few millions, or a few tens of millions of years, these primordial stars that may have been hundreds of solar masses, um, we, we're talking probably in hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, so there is plenty of time for these stars to live, to die, to seed the first, if you like, generation of metals in the universe. And then for slightly less primordial stars, probably at slightly lower masses to form, and so on. So. This is one of the things that is actually quite difficult because um, 
it, strictly speaking, yes, it is from the time they start fusing hydrogen in their cores. That's when you would call it a main sequence star. Um, we still have a lot of problems with figuring out exactly how you form a massive star in any environment without, um, you know, is it still accreting when it switches on? The answer seems to be yes, but you need some very special conditions for it to switch on and not blow away through radiation pressure all the material around it, and therefore having it ceasing to accrete more material. But it does seem that many of the larger stars turn on and yet somehow still accrete. One of the, 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 the thoughts is that actually you have multiple cores in a, in, a, in a small, relatively small volume, which themselves go through the process of merger early in the life of the star, um, which kind of makes a lot more sense um, because you, you would expect that you would clear the space around the star once it turns on. Um, uh, so, um, and it also probably helps to explain why we generally observe massive stars in large, you know, in associations. You know, binarity is an essential part of their life and their evolution. So if we're seeing them in binary and higher order associations in their lifetimes now, um, it kind of makes sense that they formed in a situation where there were multiple stars close together and which could well have merged together in a com common envelope. And I, and I think that's one of the basic explanations as to why, how you can form such an object. Yeah. One, yeah, we have time for one more. It's uh, David Thorne. David. How can planets ever be found around these really massive stars? Are we just have never enough time? Um, very, very good question. And I'm going to stick my neck out and say, no, they haven't. Now, someone's going to come up and say, oh, yeah, there was a paper. That <laughs> um, the general answer is no. Um, and um, I, I think it's precisely the point you touched on, David. Their lives are so short that it would be difficult to... Um, Assuming you had a large circumstellar disk out of which planetary material could form, the star's probably going to reach the end of its life and explode as a corporal collapse supernova um, before that happens, uh, or before any significant planet formation takes place. As I say, I, I, my simple answer would be no, you don't see them. Um, there's bound to be an exception found somewhere, but I, I, I think I'm safe in saying no at the moment. <laughs> so, yeah. Why is the Large Magellanic Cloud tragic to have the low metallicity? Is it just a feature of the Franklin and Edge Cloud, or does it apply generally? Um, the LMC generally has a metallicity of about half of the Milky Way, half of solar metallicity, if you want to take a description. The Small Magellanic Cloud is about a fifth. There are other dwarf galaxies in the local group much, much lower. Sextans A, I think, is about one-tenth. Um, if you ever look up one Zwicky 18, that's a fantastic little irregular galaxy that is, I think, still the lowest metallicity galaxy we've found in the nearby universe. Um, one of the main reasons is that, um, well, there can be two reasons. Either you don't have much more star formation happening, but you do, obviously, in, in these cases. Um, it's often in, the, in, in dwarf galaxies, it's because the precisely because they're dwarfs. Their gravitational potential well as a galaxy is shallow, and supernova explosions within those galaxies can clear out the material and eject it from the dwarf galaxy completely. So we frequently see that dwarf galaxies, and remember, a bit like stars, the smallest galaxies are the most common. In our local group, we have the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy, the Triangulum Galaxy, Everything else is a dwarf galaxy, and there's about 100 or 120 now uh, in, in the catalogues. Um, so material is lost from them very easily um, because there isn't the gravitational potential well to hold it in. So if that material is lost, then you're kind of maintaining a cleaner environment, if I can call it that. And it's quite a common feature. It's what, what makes dwarf galaxies such useful observatories of, or analogues of the early universe. Right, well, I think, uh, no, I think we'll have to have tea now, <laughs> otherwise uh, April will get uh, uh, agitated, because uh, we've got to, uh, we've got half an hour for teas and coffees now, uh, so we come back at exactly half past four.
and uh, we'll have talks about uh, asteroid occultations and forthcoming events in the sky. Thank you very much, Tim. Again, Thank you, Thank you. We will let, we will start the second half of the meeting now. Please sit down. I must, uh, must uh, call an end to the socializing now because we have an excellent talk coming up. I've heard it before, so I can, I can guarantee it will be uh, a very interesting and very clear, informative talk. Simon Kidd. Uh, well, Simon has been uh, doing astronomy uh, since the 1960s. Uh, he used to work for the BBC uh, with cameras and also in training, and uh, his knowledge of cameras came in useful when he started doing planetary imaging, uh, starting out with the Philips webcam uh, back in the, uh, back about the beginning of, of the 21st century. Uh, in more recent years, he's been concentrating on asteroid occultations, and he's completed 450 observations of, uh, of this phenomenon. Which he is now going to explain all the all the all the basics and um, try and encourage you to take up this very useful branch of research that amateurs can contribute to and create a useful body of knowledge about the minor bodies of the solar system. So, Simon Kidd. Thank you. Much, Lily. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, we'll get going. This is about asteroid occultations, indeed, uh, very much an observer's point of view. And we'll start right at the beginning, just in case you're not familiar with the general uh, geometry of it all. Um, here we are. It's very much like uh, a total solar eclipse, really. But instead of um, the sun, we have a star. And instead of uh, the moon, we have an asteroid. And the asteroid will appear to cut off the light from the star if you're in the right place on the Earth and everything lines up properly. Obviously, this is uh, not to scale. We'd be in dead trouble if it was. A uh, <laughs> phone call to Bruce Willis, I think, would be in order to try and save us. Um, what about these objects that we're trying to detect by occultations? Where do they all live? Well, as you probably know, uh, a great many of them are in the main asteroid belt uh, outside Mars but inside Jupiter. And an almost equal number, uh, we think, are um, Jupiter Trojans. So they're in the orbit of Jupiter, but preceding and following Jupiter round. Um, and also a lot of objects outside um, the orbit of Neptune. So if we zoom out and look <coughs> above the solar system, um, the blue objects there are the Kuiper Belt objects. Um, and there are a few Neptune Trojans, not very many, according to this, only about nine. And the green dots represent uh, the centaurs, which have a more unpredictable um, orbit uh, because they cross the paths of the main planets. Uh, so you can see that uh, there's, there's a huge range of um, objects that are detectable, even though a lot of them are, are quite small. OK. Um, I got into this by just happening to see that uh, there was a, an object visible from um, my location. And I thought, well, I have the telescope, I have a laptop, which I mostly use for planetary imaging, actually. I may as well have a go at uh, finding this and uh, seeing if I could see it. And uh, I thought, well, I'll run the, the time as accurately as I can on the laptop, which involved connecting to the internet, which is not really recommended, but I didn't have anything else at the time. And this is what I saw, so I'll run this little video. We're looking at the, the bottom right-hand star, if you can see that. And after a few seconds of observing, it's gone. <laughs> and about 15 seconds later, I saw that it came. <laughs> oh, no, it's gone forever. Well, that's a turn up. Yeah. This is, it's back. it's back. Hooray, it did it again. So reliable. Well. Um, I was taken aback by this. It was so accurately predicted. And I thought, that's amazing. You know, the dynamic solar system, fantastic. You know, and I thought, well, 
I'll try and do some more of those uh, because um, they, they, they were quite spectacular in a way and I thought it's, it's worth um, contributing um, to the knowledge of these things. Uh, so uh, I proceeded to find out more about it and um, asked the question, what is the point of observing them apart from seeing this dynamic aspect of the solar system? Um, there are quite a few reasons, and one of them is that um, they can actually give a position for the asteroid at the time of occultation, which is really more accurate than anything else. Uh, in fact, for the distant trans-Neptunian objects, um, it's the best way <coughs> to get fixes accurate enough for a spacecraft rendezvous. So here we are, uh, New Horizons, back in uh, 2019, 24 uh, portable scopes were used over a period of time, and the Airborne Observatory, I'm sure you've all seen that, um, a jumbo jet with a telescope on board, um, and that helped fix the position uh, of this object, which was eventually rendezvoused, 2014 MU69, which, was, uh, which is now known as Ultima Tool. Um, a very interesting object, obviously two large rocks that have come together form a contact binary. Uh, up to date, um, at the moment, NASA's Lucy spacecraft is on its way to the Jupiter Trojans. And uh, here is one of the um, asteroids that it will uh, visit, uh, Ptolemy or Ptolemyl. Um, again, a team of, a large team of people uh, observed occultations uh, to pinpoint uh, the rendezvous position. And as a bonus, they discovered that it had a moon as well. So uh, this will be a very interesting rendezvous when it gets there in 2027 from Wales. Uh, these are the seven um, asteroids that Lucy will rendezvous with. I think there are eight now, or possibly even more. Um, the largest of which is about a 150 kilometer sized object. So not a small object by any means, but the, a lot bigger than the smallest one, which you can hardly see. Um, there is an image of Lucy at the bottom there uh, with a little silhouette for scale. Um, you can see the solar uh, arrays there. One of them hasn't deployed properly as yet, but they're still working on that. But um, there's enough power for the time being to keep it going. So all is not lost. The position and orbit, of course, of uh, NEOs, near-Earth objects, is, is very important um, because of the hazard they represent. Uh, here is a hazardous object. You may have heard of this one, Apophis. Um, for a while, many years ago, this was a rather worrying object. Um, we now know that in 2029 it will not hit the Earth, but it will come very, very close. In fact, it may come within the um, orbits of the geostationary satellites, which is only 20,000 miles or so, I believe. So that, well, you wouldn't want it to be any closer. Um, which leads me to think it wouldn't take much for the orbit to change <laughs> over that period of time for something else to go wrong. But we are told that this is extremely unlikely now. But that will certainly be a spectacular um, flyby. Um, if we're still around to, uh, I think there are quite a few more hazardous things at the moment in the world than, uh, than this, to be honest. But anyway, um, what's the point? Yes, the size and the shape of the asteroid can be found. Dealing with the size, first of all, well, because the light from the star is nearly parallel, the parallel rays of light because of it's, it's so distant, the size of the shadow on the Earth, the notional shadow, you can't actually see it, of course, um, does represent the size of the asteroid. Now, of course, if the asteroid's not actually spherical, and a large number of them uh, aren't spherical, it would depend on the uh, orientation of the asteroid as well. Uh, but you can see the general principle there. Um, it's not common to have uh, observers uh, arranged so neatly across the path as that, but uh, you get the idea. Here's a slightly... Um, more elaborate sort of um, idea here. Um, we have a predicted shadow path going from North America, North America to Africa, and five observers. Um, observers A and E are not going to see any occultation. 
B, C, and D will see an occultation, but of varying lengths. So if they time the duration uh, when the star is occulted and plot them on a graph, taking into account their differences of location on the Earth, you can get an idea of the shape of the object that has caused the occultation. So here is you know, a modest number of observers um, with good agreement between themselves um, from different countries. And you can see that the shape of this particular object called Hermione um, is starting to be resolved quite nicely. And this adds some uh, professional uh, modeling data to it, uh, which also agrees quite, quite nicely with the observations. Again, going back to the point of observing, there is the possibility of discovering something unusual uh, around the asteroid. Uh, here is uh, an asteroid with a very small moon. What do we see in that case? Well, this is totally out of scale, of course. Uh, <laughs> a very big asteroid occulting a tiny star. You would, of course, get a double dip like that. Um, it's quite un well, it's not unusual, but it's not so common to see the, uh, the asteroid itself. Uh, only the biggest asteroids can be seen, actually, on your camera, uh, reflecting some sunlight. Uh, it's more usual to see uh, just the star itself, just the small size of the uh, average asteroid. OK, now this is a, a real observation, so uh, quite well observed this. Um, asteroid Sylvia, um, but two observers um, saw an extra object. This observer down here saw a very small occultation, but didn't see the main occultation down here. This observer saw a very small occultation there, a brief occultation, I should say, and also the main occultation here. Um, so that was, that was quite lucky in a way, because um, both of the small moons, Romulus and Remus, that are attached to Sylvia had been found, had been um, located by this observation. Uh, so you can see that not only um, the position and shape of Sylvia is starting to get very well resolved, but the location and distances and even size of the moons is uh, pretty well known from this at that particular moment in time. Um, if you were to detect two dips on the light curve, well, uh, basically, there are two possibilities. Um, it could be an asteroid with a moon, or maybe it's a double star that's so close together with the couple that uh, you can't resolve it in your telescope. Um, so can, can that be, can you give general rules about, or, or, or theories about um, how you could tell the difference? Well, uh, example number one, where the light curve dips to the same level, is more likely to be uh, there we are, and a double asteroid. You can imagine uh, a single star first being occulted by the main asteroid, then by the moon. You'd expect the light to dip to the same level. However, if you've got uh, a curve where the dips were to different levels, more likely to be a double star because the components of a binary are quite unlikely to be exactly the same level. So um, firstly, uh, the asteroid would occult one, then the other, and you'd get different um, dips on your light curve. Um, I dare say it's possible for an asteroid with a moon to occult a double star, which gets a little bit more complicated, uh, but uh, the principle would still hold. Uh, I don't know if that's happened, actually. Probably. OK, now here's an unexpected thing that happened. Um, two observers in Australia, Dave Galt and Pete Nosworthy, in 2002, um, you can see their observatories here, not that far apart. This is one of them and this is the other, so a few miles apart. What they were expecting to see from the prediction was uh, one large object um, causing an occultation over one of the sites. Okay, now if I run the video, uh, you'll see actually what happened. Here we go. Um, this is what was predicted, but what actually happened was they both saw an occultation, which is fantastically fortunate, I would say. <laughs> They're just in the right place to both record an occultation. Now, you could say, well, you know, surely ju this just indicates, you know, one really huge asteroid, which it could do. But actually, from other observations, 
from other sources, it has been proven to be two objects. So that was a, a really neat discovery. And uh, they were fortunate, but you know, you make your own luck, don't you? You, you, know, you, you try these observations, even though maybe you're not on the predicted path, because you never know quite what's going to happen. So it was very good they did. Um, OK, the scientific collaboration. Yes, it's very satisfying to contribute to something that you know is going to be of use to researchers um, of all sorts. Um, things are published and available on databases. And, and of course, if you discover um, something unique, you might make a name for yourself. Uh, OK, this is where I observed from in Hertfordshire. And this is the trusty C14 that I use. Um, however, nearly as good on brighter stars would be a small telescope. You don't need uh, a massive telescope to observe brighter stars. In fact, I've used uh, a smaller telescope uh, where brighter stars are involved, really, because it was more suitable. Um, all it means is you can't observe occultations of uh, very faint stars, that's all. I would say that uh, a tracking um, scope and maybe a go-to does make life an awful lot easier. Um, but uh, in theory, you know, you might already have the equipment that you, you need, mostly, for observing. Um, what other equipment is needed? Well, you, um, you might say, well, uh, how about a stopwatch? And that is possible. <laughs> to do it with a stopwatch, but I'm not going to re really talk about that because it's not a particularly satisfactory way of doing things anymore. It's not really accurate enough. Um, so we would normally use a camera. Again, you may already have a, a suitable camera. Uh, a laptop to record the pictures, basically. Windows 10 is a very good idea. Um, not that many people uh, are still on older operating systems, I, I guess, but. The, the, the way that the operating system handles time is much improved on Windows 10 onwards. So that, that, that really is a must-have. Um, capture software. Um, there's a number of really good free um, uh, programs there. Um, I use SharpCap. Um, it's it's uh, commonly used um, by observers of occultations. Um, Fire Capture is another brilliant um, uh, program, but it's not generally recommended. The emphasis during its development hasn't been placed on timing as much, so it's not quite as consistent as SharpCap. And the formats commonly used, uh, well, SIR or ADV fits. Um, very important, of course, for the um, uh, observations to be of value is that the, you have accurate timings and that it's consistent, um, and your clock really should be running with a millisecond accuracy, if possible. Um, and the aim, really, is for all timings to be a tenth of a second or better. Uh, quite often, it is a lot better than that. But where you've got faint stars, of course, you can only run at a certain speed with the camera because you're needing longer exposures. So at its worst, you may only be able to resolve time to a quarter or even half a second. Uh, but they, that could still be a valuable result, though. So. We just do our best on that point, really. Uh, camera choices. Well, for a long time, um, analog video cameras were uh, thought of as, as, the, as the best sort of standard, really, especially the Watek type cameras with uh, very good sensitivity, because you can insert the timestamps uh, at the analog level before it gets to any laptop or computer. So it's, it's once you know the, the, the delay involved in doing that, uh, you're always going to have consistent um, timestamps. So, so that's it. They're very sensitive and, and very consistent if set up properly. Uh, disadvantages, well, they are actual video cameras and so uh, don't really run at different speeds. Uh, so you can't resolve time to, to more than uh, 20 or 40 milliseconds. Um, or, of course, uh, the cameras that mostly use these days for all sorts of other jobs um, CCD or CMOS cameras. Um, global shutter is best. This is the type where all of the frames are exposed at the same time. Uh, but rolling shutter cameras are also OK. And there's, there's only a small error usually induced uh, by that, especially if you use a short region of interest on your frame. It's the height of the frame that uh, determines the difference between the top line and the bottom line, which is usually only a few milliseconds. So we're not talking a great amount. Um, and yes, 
you can, they're more flexible in, in several ways. Uh, I use binning um, on, on my CMOS <coughs> camera partly to um, better match the telescope. Uh, C14 really has far too long a focal length to, um, uh, for this work, uh, even with the reducer, and this, this just helps it all match up a lot better. It's a uh, good, good benefit. Disadvantages, well, um, this for a long time um, was what people were worried about a few years ago, uh, that the, the Windows operating system, which is not real time, can cause uh, irregularities with the time stamping. So it might be consistent, uh, might have a consistent delay for a while, but then all of a sudden go out by quite a long way and then come back again. You never really know. Um, things have improved and you can mitigate that problem um, with care. And here's an example of a Windows interrupt, not with astronomy, but this poor lady is trying to do the weather forecast and Windows has decided that it would be a good idea to put up on air an advert to upgrade uh, the system. Um, yeah, we've all had that. Um, so what can you do? Uh, well, use a well-resourced, yeah, a decent laptop with plenty of capacity, <coughs> disconnect from the internet, switch off antivirus software, which I do, but you can never win, can you? I mean, the other day I did that, and then about 10 minutes later, something popped up telling me to... Uh, switch the antivirus back on. <laughs> okay. Um, change the capture program priority. Yeah, I didn't know about this until I looked into it. Um, you can change the priority of a, uh, of a program in Windows via the task manager uh, to something called real time, which it isn't, of course, but it's the top priority level in Windows. So presumably, it'll get interrupted less often if you do that. And, uh, yeah, as a general check, uh, have a look at how hard the CPU is working when you're recording uh, at a very high rate, high frame rate, just to check that it's all, all uh, you know, well within its capability. Now, I think this is the future, really. Um, they're more expensive, these cameras, but they do have um, a built-in time solution. And the top one, the QHY, um, has this GPS receiver which stamps the time frames before it gets to any recording system, before it gets to your laptop. And the same for the DV DVT-i cam. I think that's developed by some Swiss astronomers. Uh, they're both fairly expensive, about 1,100 pounds, and I think about 8, 850 for that one. Hopefully the price will come down, but this has got to be the answer, really, that you have a camera, you plug it in, and it will not only supply the pictures, but the correct time as well, with no, no doubts about its uh, um, accuracy. But um, unless you've got one of those, and I'm sure quite a few BAA members do have these. In fact, I know they do. Um, you could use an ordinary camera quite successfully if you take some uh, precautions. Uh, in which case, you'll probably be using the uh, laptop clock for your source of time. Uh, how accurate is that? Well, it's awful. I think this laptop, which is the one I use, loses, oh, I don't know, a couple of minutes a week probably. So there's absolutely terrible accuracy, um, even if you use the web to update it. Because there's always this question about whether it's updating properly and accurately or whether there's some problem with the servers and it's caused an error to creep in. You never quite know um, what's going on. Uh, so what you need is a local source of time. It's the old question for hundreds of years. <laughs> Perhaps not one of those, but um, maybe GPS, of course. Uh, we can use that in conjunction with our laptop clock. So this is more or less the system that I uh, had, it, it, my sort of interim version. The first version was with a Raspberry Pi, actually, a little mini computer with a GPS add-on <coughs> module. And there were some advantages, uh, disadvantages to that, but it actually worked really well. Um, but now I've settled on this little box, a uh, commercial box called a Leo NTP server, which is um, basically a, a GPS receiver uh, with a server. And it uses NTP, network time protocol, in the same way that the internet does to control your laptop clock. But it's not connected to the internet. So although it's an internet protocol, um, it's just the protocol that it's using. It's not actually using um, any connection to the web. 
Um, and that should be extremely accurate. Now, the NTP is extremely accurate, but overall, the laptop clock um, is usually, when I check the logging, it's less than a millisecond, about just under half a millisecond normally. Um, so you can virtually say that that's that problem sorted. It, it, it is very reliable, and, and the clock's running very, very accurately. Um, but there is always, well, there was, I suppose there still is to, to, to a certain extent, um, what about interrupts? Can you absolutely guarantee that nothing has happened to your laptop? Well, you can't, I suppose. But is there a way of verifying um, your timestamps a little bit more um, certainly? Um, so I thought about this and had a look at various uh, solutions on the web and, and, and came up with uh, an idea. It's not totally original. Um, and that was to add uh, a flash of light to the um, camera um, using a one PPS pulse. That's one pulse per second. That's an extremely accurate uh, pulse derived by the Leo NTP box, an output on a little jack on the back, and it, that's got sufficient power to drive a little LED. So you can connect an LED directly to that, and that's extremely accurate. So 30 nanoseconds is the spec in the manual. So Yes, again, you can regard it as, as absolutely spot on. And that puts a little flash every second onto the camera. Um, it doesn't tell you which second it is, <laughs> but it tells you it's the beginning of a new second. But to be honest, if, if your laptop was running with that sort of gross error that you didn't know which second it was, that's, that would be pretty hopeless. Something's gone badly wrong. Um, but if there are any engineers here who could devise a way of identifying the seconds, say like a double flash on every 10 seconds. That would, that would be absolutely great because you could actually tell absolute time from that. Anyway, this is, the, this is sort of schematic of how it was done. There's the uh, signal uh, going to an LED. It goes down a single optical fiber, which is supported by a brass microtube and goes into the corner of the camera chip. That's a cross section of it. Um, the brass tube supports the optical fiber, but also um, acts as a sort of a baffle to stop light splurging all over the, the, the chip, which it doesn't do. So there's no complicated lenses to fiddle around with or get the focus just right. And OK, it's not then uh, a particularly tight little dot of light, but it doesn't interfere with the main body of the um, you know, surface. So I think we can see that, actually. Oops. Oh, gone on too far. Go back. Here we are. So this is a, a rather not very good video. It's not running very consistently, but, but you can see the dot of light in the corner, was, which is what I wanted you to see there. So yeah, it's a bit blobby, but uh, <laughs> I think in the compression process, this has got all rather uh, jittery, but, uh, but never mind. You see the general idea. So how's that actually achieved in practice, uh, this little idea? Well, it's got a, a little uh, project box on the back of the camera, which is a ZWO174 uh, global shutter camera. And this is what adds the flash um, to the surface of the chip every one second. If you take the, the um, front of the camera off, this is how it was done. You can see uh, as we um, the brass microtube paint painted black, supported by this little carrier, ends up very close uh, to, but not touching <laughs> the chip. Uh, these holes here with the mounting screws are already there, so I could use that. I did have to drill a little hole there for the tube to come in. So that's uh, how it was done. The control box uh, looks rather Heath Robinson, and it is. Uh, but it has worked very well for several years. Um, the way it works, uh, the signal comes in on this audio connector here. Uh, through a little limiting resistor there to the LED. And that shines directly onto the end of the optical fiber, uh, which is supported on this spring strip. Now, the idea of that is that uh, it's a level control for the brightness of the flash. Um, when you've got a long exposure or a short exposure, you'll need to adjust possibly the brightness of the flash as well. Otherwise, it becomes invisible or too bright. So this does it very effectively. Um, you might say, well, why, why can't you have a, a, a really neat 
electronic control. The trouble with most electronic controls, I gather, um, that control brightnesses of LEDs, they can induce either a flicker or delay, which is precisely what you don't want to happen. So I thought, well, let's have no question at all. I'll try this. Will it work? Um, this simple solution, and it does work, and I've stuck with it. It's absolutely fine. Uh, this is the little carrier. Uh, it was originally, originally on a 224 camera. It works pretty well on that as well. And these are the little components, uh, not very expensive, all available on eBay. And uh, it does go a long way to verifying your timestamps. I always go through the videos once I've recorded and check that the beginning of the flash is on the expected um, frame, taking into account the likely delay that Windows has taken to actually stamp that frame, which is pretty consistent if you use the... Um, if you use uh, the same ROI and the, the same setup uh, all the time, which I do. So uh, I just uh, put a 16 millisecond uh, correction on it because that's how, how long my computer takes to stamp uh, a frame incoming from the camera. And that seems to always check out. I don't think I've had a failure uh, with that. Uh, so uh, it's, it's sort of reassuring, really. Uh, another way of using light to um, time your videos, uh, if you've got a portable setup and you just want um, you know, to use it occasionally, uh, you can get uh, an app called Occult Flash Tag for Android phones, and that will flash the camera flash at a certain logged time before the event and a certain logged time after the event. And you just hold it in front of the telescope and you get a bright flash on the frame, and then you can um, extrapolate those times to work out when your um, event actually happened, uh, which is, sounds great. Uh, the trouble is it's derived from um, Internet NTP again. So, OK, it's going to be pretty good, but not perhaps ultimate consistency or accuracy. OK, on to a real um, example. Um, you can see the predicted path there. This is Electra. Uh, back in uh, 2018, but there's a reason why I'm going by, going so far back in time for this one. It was a good example. Um, there was some knowledge about it before, two moons, uh, non-spherical, and so on, and composition was uh, kind of known. Here's a not very good picture of it. <laughs> it looks like a composite thing to me. It doesn't look very good. Um, and again, some uh, professional um, 3D modeling. Um, so uh, quite a bit was known. Uh, the Dammit modeling stands for that. Don't ask me how that's done, but I just like the sound of it. Um, and here is um, <coughs> a screenshot of, um, from the prediction software that, that tells you also who is going to observe this event. So nine UK observers. There are only six shown for some reason, um, but there were nine in the end. And all these, these black lines, which you can see, represent um, the position, laterally, of an observer. So you can see that this path is very well covered from side to side. The center line of the prediction is given by this green line here. You can just see that, I think, maybe. And the edges of the prediction are, on one side, this blue line and this blue line here. And uh, that's me there, I think. And you, you can see that I was actually outside the prediction, but um, I did actually see an occultation. So, you know, just, just goes to show that um, it, it's always worth observing if you're close to one of these things. You never know what's going to happen. But the good thing about this was that the path actually went right across Europe and right down Italy. So there's a huge number of observers potentially able to, to watch um, this event. And even better... The weather was good, so um, yeah, clear across the whole of Europe. Um, so a good smattering, I think it's over 50, um, with um, useful sort of outriders here picking up any unusual things. So what happened? Well, I got my um, custom chart ready um, from, again, it's just derived from this uh, prediction software, very handy. So that uh, enters a few, a few personal things, and like the, the field of view of my camera and so on. So handy for finding um, things quickly. And this is what I recorded. 
I think it's on the 224 actually, but anyway, the star of interest is here. So I'll run this and you'll see that after a few seconds, as before, it's gone. Actually, you can still see it. Well, you can't see the star. This asteroid is big enough that you can see it through directed, uh, reflected sunlight. So you can see it here, and then after a few seconds, it's moved out of the way, and we see the star sort of full level again. So that was the event. Um, the light curve, um, We'll go, move on to those in more detail in a moment. But you can see it, it was represented by this uh, uh, pinkish trace here. Um, so a nice uh, clear-cut um, occultation there. Um, this was one of the guide stars in the frame at the same time. And you can see that that actually was getting brighter as the occultation went on. That's due to cloud, but very useful. In fact, essential to have such a star in your frame because you can then use that to normalize your light curve on your target star. So this actually represents the level of the uh, uh, light coming from the object, um, irrespective of what's happening with the clouds. So um, very good for that, this software. Um, the report was uh, filled in. It looks awfully complicated and boring, but uh, a lot of it is pre-filled in with your own details. Um, the way of reporting is changing, big change in, in Europe um, from uh, the beginning of 2023. And these are the initial results. So yes, over 50 um, uh, people uh, got a successful uh, cord on this object. And you can see it's starting to define the object really well. And here is the uh, dammit modeling included. Uh, and it also fits really well. Now, I'm not sure quite why that's not rotated. It, was ob it would obviously fit better if it was rotated clockwise by a small amount. I've got the feeling that, that the, the results are, the, are what was actually observed, and maybe the model is predicted. So a small discrepancy there, but you can see there's a very close uh, correlation. So that, that was a really good ob observation. OK, uh, we're lucky with uh, the number of observers and the weather and so on. But uh, it was a really good example of how it can all work, all fit together with uh, uh, professional astronomers. And of course, we do need to know more about um, near-Earth uh, asteroids. Uh, right, how do we, how do we uh, get the timings from these light curves? Well, uh, this is uh, the software that, that you've just seen briefly. It's called Tangra. Uh, it's brilliant and, and fairly simple in essence. Uh, you just click on the stars, okay, and you tell it to run, and it draws out the light curves. That's essentially what happens. And you can see that, um, yeah, there's quite a bit of noise there, but uh, it, it's still got a very clear-cut uh, dip there. This is a different uh, uh, event, by the way. And this is yet another different event, but you can see that with a very sharp... Um, um, disappearance phase and reappearance, um, it's looking like it's pretty easy to get um, accurate times. But you don't have to work that out by yourself. You just uh, open it up in another program called AOTA, and this will, well, in this case, it's almost completely automatic. It will uh, find the dip and work out the, the possible errors in everything statistically and give you the final times, which appear in a little box at the bottom. Um, so ideally, that's, that's what happens. It, it kind of does it for you. I mean, obviously, there's quite a lot to it when it isn't quite that clear cut. Um, and here's an example of it not being clear cut, where you've got a very small dip. So let's say we had a large, bright asteroid occulting a faint star. You can imagine even if there is an occultation, the dip will be extremely small. And in this case, only one-tenth of a magnitude. So you wouldn't really see that at the eyepiece at all. But uh, we can see a dip here. Uh, in this case, it's best to use a program called uh, Pyote or Pyote. Um, so called, I think, partly because it runs on Python, programming language. And this works in a slightly different way in that it analyzes the whole of your recording, all of the noise, and you can see it is rather a noisy recording, and then stati statistically um, um, examines any areas that seem to be outside the statistical normal of, of that um, 
particular recording. And you'll still get a result. Obviously, it won't be as clear cut. There'll be larger errors, uh, possible errors uh, involved in that, but it's still a result. And uh, of course, your midpoint might, might well be reasonably accurate, even on that. Uh, where do you find uh, information on these? Well, there's, there's another brilliant uh, piece of free software uh, called Occult Watcher, which uh, you fill in uh, with your own personal details about where you are, what sort of telescope, and what size telescope, and, and various other parameters, so that you get a personalized list of events uh, happening um, near you. I mean, not precisely near you, uh, at, at your place, but as, as long as you're reasonably close to the event, it will, it will point you towards them. And uh, there's actually one tonight for me uh, in Hertfordshire. You can see that the readout here, now this blue section here represents the width of the predicted shadow, and all these little dots represent observers. There's the midpoint. I'm actually just outside that, but again, that would be something I'd normally um, watch. Um, it's probably foggy tonight, but... Uh, um, so, but there's a good number of observers there, so, so that's, that's looking good. So in summary, if you, uh, if you want to, again, yes, continuing a theme, uh, make a, a contribution, and you get some satisfaction from that, um, it's, it's a good thing uh, to, to get involved with. Um, and especially as a lot of you may, might have most of the equipment you need already. Um, if you haven't seen one, just have a look sometime as well through the eyepiece. It's, it's like an, a total eclipse, I suppose. You, you, it's more surprising than you expect it to be, if, that, if you understand what I mean. That's it. <laughs>
Uh, the sun has kind of been behaving rather oddly recently. It went through a phase of being really active, then it went through a phase of being not very active at all, and it's kind of now heading back to being slightly active again. So this is the uh, picture from STO this morning, uh, a few nice spot groups. And we've had some nice, nice images submitted to the website. This one from James Waitman, taken in hydrogen alpha, showing spot groups and various other features on the sun. And then this wonderful one from Carl Burr on really high resolution showing spot groups. This is white light spot groups and the granulation. Here's another one, another hydrogen alpha showing the sun with some very nice prominences. Just before the last meeting, we had a partial eclipse. And by some kind of miracle, it was actually clear over much of, uh, of the UK. Um, I did a live stream of this on YouTube. and. Uh, Anyone who's ever done this before will know there are lots of very strange people on YouTube, and some of the comments, if anyone watched this, were really entertaining. <laughs> there was one from somebody who said, unfortunately, I can't see it because my window's pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> Had you thought about going outside? But then I thought maybe they were in prison, and you don't really want to be. <laughs> but anyway, it, lots of people watched this. I think I had about... 2,500, 3,000 views, which is nothing compared to the Kardashians or something, but was quite impressive for an astronomical event. Uh, if the sun's active, you get aurorae, and there's been a whole good number of those. Um, not, a while, not long ago, when we had the Elgin meeting, I, I installed a camera up at Dennis's, which allows him to keep an eye on his northern horizon to, uh, to spot aurorae before they get too bright. And uh, he's used this quite a lot and goes outside. This wasn't taken with that camera. This was taken with uh, a Sony camera. I think it's a Sony or is it a Canon? It's a Canon 550. But the, um, the little camera he's got on the back of his shed warns him when, when there are no auroras around so he can go out and see it. Our deep sky section director has recently uh, abandoned the... Uh, the the county of Gloucestershire and gone all the way back to uh, Orkney. So he's living up in Orkney now and he also has got a camera uh, up there and he's seeing quite a few of these events. So this is the same event as the one that Dennis saw. So um, really nice, really nice aurorae. There's, there's quite a lot of them around at the moment. Um, and uh, just keep an eye on the, the AO observers pages for these pictures. The, both Callum and Dennis post them quite regularly. The moon, of course, um, this, is the, uh, this is my kind of list of what's going on with the moon. We are currently just about, just after full moon. Um, the next new moon is December 23rd. So there'll be some good dark skies over the Christmas period for those of you who want to do some deep sky or comet observing. And of course, at full moon in November, we had a lunar eclipse. Um, now, that lunar eclipse wasn't visible from here, uh, but it was visible from New Zealand, where Maurice Collins got this, this lovely view of it. I would complain that the moon is upside down, but of course, <laughs> it isn't from New Zealand. That's the way it is. Um, so, flat earthers explain that. <laughs> um, Mike Harlow made use of some free facilities that you can get. So, I telescope you need to be a member of to use the telescopes, but you can always look at their all sky cameras. And uh, what Mike did was quite an interesting experiment looking at the all sky camera that you can see here in New Mexico and the one in Siding Spring. And he actually made an estimate of how bright the eclipsed moon was. And it's about as bright as Jupiter, so about magnitude minus two and a half. So the full moon is about minus 12 and a half, I think. So that's 10 magnitudes different. 10 magnitudes is 100 squared. That's 10,000 times fainter. So uh, that shows you that the, uh, the Earth is actually quite an opaque object um, because it's cast this shadow onto the, onto the moon. Uh, and all the light that the moon sees, obviously, is re refracted around the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the moon is an excellent occulting disk, but it is actually quite an interesting object in its own right. And um, one of the people here, Bill, a <laughs> uh, good acorn medalist, um, has been taking some really spectacular pictures of the moon. I'm amazed you get such good seeing in Sheffield. Oh, it's always wonderful. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the Venice of the North, it's isn't the Barbados. it? <laughs> Barbados of the North. Well, we'll come to Barbados in a minute. Um, so, yeah, so at this time of the year, early evening, um, you've got um, 
uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the, the evening sky. Saturn's pretty much getting low and sort of disappearing now, but Jupiter's been a very bright object, surprisingly high up when you go out and have a look at it uh, for quite a while. So got some nice images here of Saturn from all of the usual suspects. So uh, Jeff Lewis there on the left, Martin Lewis on the right, no relation, I assume. Um, and so Anthony Wesley from Australia, uh, which is, uh, you know, they, they, amazing resolution on those planets. This one, though, you mentioned Barbados. This is uh, Ian Sharp, Damien Peach image that they took from Barbados earlier this year. This is uh, September. It's really quite a stunning image, this. Um, uh, Ian commented that this is probably about the best data that they've ever got. So, I mean, you have to slum it. You have to go to Barbados to do this, which I know is, is kind of rather painful for them. But the, the quality of the images that they, they get from there is just stunning. But you can get pretty good stuff from the UK. So this is Martin's one, um, you know, showing a lot of detail there in Jupiter. And, of course, uh, you, can, you can draw it as well. So Paul, I don't know how... They look a bit overexposed on these screens, actually, but um, the, these are really good drawings. Uh, have a look at them on the website where you can probably see a bit more, bit more detail. I really like this one. This is from Manolo Rodriguez, and it's a, a kind of section of rotating Jupiter. So it shows what the planet looks like, just rotating back and forth like that. Really, really good detail again. And then... An alternative, if you live somewhere where the weather is not so good, is you make your own <laughs> Jupiter. Uh, this is uh, a Jupiter picture that I took, actually, in the Excel center. Um, those people at the bottom there deserve, uh, deserve credit for, for doing this. Uh, Dave, particularly, I think, climbed up on top of a, um, a combine harvester for you to stick this thing up in the, in the sky. Um, but this is basically what we were doing at New Scientist Live. We have, we have a planet, in this case, uh, on top of a combine harvester with a telescope, uh, which is one of Crayford's telescopes. And we get loads and loads of people just to come along and look at this. And it's just amazing to see how excited people are looking at, looking at a, a model of Jupiter. Um, <laughs> so even more so when they actually get to see the real thing. But it's a great thing just to introduce people to how to look through telescopes. And... Um, Anyone who's done this will know that most people don't know how to look through a telescope, so you have to explain exactly what to do, where to put your eye, all that kind of stuff. Martin's uh, got some pretty impressive pictures as well of Jupiter's satellites. So this is both Ganymede and Io. Yeah, Ganymede and Io. So what you've got here is the actual image on the left and, and a simulation of it on the right, so you can actually see various features uh, and how they line up. Uranus is around in the sky at the moment. Uh, Luigi Moroni has got an image which actually shows detail on the surface of um, Uranus, uh, which is pretty amazing. And then Peter Tickner actually managed to image the various moons of Uranus here as well. So that's a, that's a project to do, and, and Uranus is around. Um, it's in Aries at the moment. It's, uh, it's reasonably well placed if you want to, to go and have a look to find it, uh, uh, either visually or, or take some images. Towards midnight, though, the planet that really dominates, uh, and everyone, I'm sure, in this room must have seen this, is Mars. If you go out uh, around about midnight, there's this incredibly bright red thing in the sky, high up. And Mars is really high up. And if you want to know what you're going to see when you look at Mars, this is a wonderful tool that's actually on our website at the moment by Aid Ashford. It's a, a, a Mars mapper you can put in your... Uh, the time and date, and it will actually show you what you're actually seeing. So, so you can actually understand what you're going to be seeing through the telescope. And Richard McKim, who's director of the Mars section, um, provided this. This is a, an example of his Mars drawings through the last opposition of Mars, 2020 to 20, uh, 2021. Um, showing all of the different features on the disk as Mars rotates. Because Mars rotates on its axis, I think, is it 24 hours, 24 hours, 30 minutes, something like that, a little bit longer, hours. a little bit longer than 24 hours. So if you observe Mars at the same time every night, 
you'll actually see the same face of the planet every time you look. So the thing to do is to try and observe Mars over a long period. And you can do that if you, if you try hard. So on the left here are some drawings done by Paul um, over quite a long period. So how long was this? This was Nine hours. Nine hours. I think you deserve an award for, for doing that. But this is nine hours. So what Paul saw here was an entire one-third rotation of the planet Mars. So, so you need to do that for an, another two sets of nine hours separated by quite a few days to get the whole, the whole disc. That's probably contract hypothermia. Well, it was, it was about minus three or something minus when you did four, yeah. Minus four. Oh. I'm very impressed by these people who actually go outside and observe it. It's good stuff. Um, and then on the right, a drawing by David Graham, uh, a, a well-known Mars observer. So again, showing, showing features on the planet. Uh, some images here, uh, this one from Martin again, uh, another one from Martin, Re really amazing resolution. I think the, the di disc diameter of Mars at the moment is about 17 arcs. 17.1 arcs. 17.1. 17 was accurate. Good. Um, a few more by Peter Tickner there showing features uh, on Mars, and uh, uh, those are the clouds presumably over the... Which way up is this? No, north, north and bottom. Yeah, so it's north, north polar hook. And a few more as well here uh, by Jeff Lewis, showing, showing again amazing resolution on the planet. So uh, this is the moon, which is good at occulting things. Uh, but you may see that there is this object there, which is Mars. So this is the occultation that occurred a few days ago of Mars by the moon. Uh, it was taken with my deep, spy, deep sky camera that I use for comet imaging, but CMOS cameras are incredibly flexible these days. This is a 60 megapixel camera. So this is a full 60 megapixel image. And if you actually zoom in on where Mars is, you can actually see some detail on its surface. And that big crater there is Grimaldi, so the big dark crater Grimaldi. So I've got quite a few Mars occultation things, which I'll just run through fairly quickly. So this is uh, David, our president, David Arditi's uh, animation uh, of the immersion. So this is Mars going behind the moon. Your seeing, David, was kind of similar to mine. It's uh, pretty rubbish. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, but it took something like 30 seconds to, to disappear behind the moon. <coughs> this is uh, Alan Halsey's picture of it. It's, it's like if you think of the kind of moonrise picture of the Earth over the moon that was taken by the Apollo. It's our opportunity to see something like that. But it's also when you compare the size. The moon is half the diameter of Mars, but Mars is 200 times further away. So it kind of gives you an idea of scale. Simon's picture, when he's not doing occultations. <laughs> um, and then a few others by people. So, so loads of people took it. So I apologize to those that I haven't managed to, to include in this. But quite a lot of people posted stuff on the website. So, so again, Alex, when he wasn't doing occultation work, managed to find some time uh, to do this as well. So this is pretty good, isn't it? This is a single frame from a video, which looks really nice. But if you do some magic on it, <laughs> you get this. So this is, I think, Martin, this is the best image that I've seen of the occultation. I mean, it really is stunning. It is a bit of a cheat, because I think you process the two things separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. But it is, it is really, really, really good. Um, so that was the Mars occultation. Um, anyone who missed that, there's another planetary occultation coming up on January the 1st, which won't be anywhere near as spectacular. It's an occultation of Uranus by the moon. And it's a grazing occultation. So where I am in Chelmsford, Uranus isn't actually occulted by the moon, but you need to go up into Suffolk a little bit further north than me to actually get it disappearing behind the moon. But watch out for that. So it's, um, it's actually the evening of January the 1st, so not the morning of January the 1st, which is good, because it means you've got a whole day to recover from New Year's <laughs> Eve before you have a go at observing it. Uh, a few images here. Luigi Moroni's got some images of Neptune, which again shows some detail on the surface, not much, but some, and that's pretty impressive given how small Neptune is. 
And then I haven't mentioned Venus. Uh, Venus is um, not, not visible at the moment, but it, it does start coming out in the uh, evening sky towards the end of January. And there's a nice conjunction, although they're all far south, there's a nice conjunction of the Moon, Venus and Saturn on the 23rd of January. So another date to put in your diary, potentially a, a nice planetary picture. So that's all the planets, most of the solar system done. We've got comets still to come, but we'll go into doing some variables now. And this is an interesting one. This is B482 Cygni. And this is a light curve that Jeremy sent me of 482 Cygni. It's, um, is it kind of our Corona Borealis yeah. type thing? Yeah, so, so essentially what you've got is you've got the star sits here, sits there normally at about 12th magnitude. And uh, very unusually, it dips down quite faint to about 16th magnitude. Um, now, you can see there are some points here which don't fit in with this light curve. And you might say, well, why, why is that? They're mine, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need to delete them from the database. <laughs> and uh, the reason is, is that this star is irritatingly close to a 13th magnitude star, this one here. Um, and all of my photometry is automated and I don't actually bother looking at it and I just put all the data in. So I, I, Gary said to me, there's something wrong, something wrong with your magnitude estimates. And the reason was is that my photometric aperture was actually including this bright star. Now this bright star, bright-ish star, is included as a, a warning on the AABSO Find a chart, so I should have known that it was there. But one of the things that came out of this fade, and these fades are quite rare. When, when was the last one? Early 90s. Early 90s, so it doesn't do it very often. Is that in my images, there is actually another star there, a 15th magnitude star, which is right by the, the variable. So in the past, when this star faded down, it's quite likely, I think, that people actually included this 15th magnitude star in. So. Uh, I apologise for polluting the database with my bright star, <laughs> but other people have been including that star too. I have actually got a, stream, uh, a string of photometry now that I've, I've done with a very small aperture, but it's not very good, so I'm not sure whether I want to submit it or not. But I definitely will delete the old, old stuff. But it, has, it, has it come back pretty much to where it started? Where 12.3. Right, so it's not quite as bright as it was no, before it went down. But still, still definitely worth watching. It's in Cygnus, so it's reasonably accessible uh, in the evening sky at the moment. Here's another one. This is a lovely picture by uh, Mazen Yunis. This is uh, Novacast 2 2021, I think it is, V1405. Uh, it's a lovely picture because this nova uh, is, is in a really nice photogenic field. It's near the bubble nebula, so uh, it's... Relatively easy to find. It's been around for a long time now. I mean, it went off in 2001. Um, and it's just been fading very, very slowly. So it's still, you know, 12th magnitude or so. So this is, uh, this is a nova definitely worth keeping an eye on. And Mike Harlow has been doing some regular spectroscopy of this using a, what, what would be considered a really old-fashioned technique. So instead of using a diffraction grating, he uses a glass prism over the objective of a telescope. So what you've got here is spectra of all the star, different stars in the field, and you can immediately see which one is a bit odd. <coughs> this one here. It's got lots of emission lines in it, including this very bright emission line, which is hydrogen alpha, which is uh, why the star looks quite red in Mazin's photograph. So the really nice thing of these, these uh, objective prism images is that you can very quickly see stuff that's odd about, about certain stars. <coughs> what are these things then? <coughs> are they? Hmm. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll ask Mike about that sometime. And then breaking news in the variable star field is this one. This is RWCFI, which uh, Jeremy posted something about on the forum last night. Um, it's, it's starting, it looks like it's starting to go into a fade. And is that, that's quite unusual for this object, is it? doesn't do it very often? Right. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, this one is, is definitely worth keeping an eye on. It's a bright, bright object, so it's, it's kind of binocular object that you can, you can keep an eye on. It's in Cepheus, uh, so again, well-placed for us. Um, okay, another variable star. This, of course, is the Crab Nebula, uh, a lovely picture by Mazin again, taken from his remote telescope in Morocco. But the thing that drives the Crab Nebula is a pulsar. At the center of this uh, nebula is a, a pulsar, which is a neutron star. And that neutron star is rotating, I think it's about 30 times a second or so, the Crab Pulsar. And so this is a variable star whose entire light, light curve lasts for 1 30th of a second. Now, many years ago in the 1970s, professional astronomers used various techniques to actually measure that light curve. But very few amateurs have done this. And there's a great thing which is in the December journal at the moment, and which is posted on the, the web page by David Hardwick. And what David used was a conventional CMOS camera, but with a mechanical stroboscopic shutter running in front of the camera. And that's rotating at a rate slightly different from the predicted rate that the pulsar rotates. So what you get is a strobos stroboscopic effect, a bit like um, what you, you see in kind of movies where the wagon wheel on a, on a uh, wagon goes around because it's slightly different from the frame rate of the camera. So he's managed to do that, and he can, he's identified the pulsar, which I think is really impressive. You can see it, it going on and off. It's, it's quite close to another star. You see it getting bright and then fading away. And you have this really nice light curve, which is very similar to the light curves that the professionals have published, um, showing a big peak and then a, a smaller peak. But all of this is 1 30th of a second. So that's a pretty fast variable star. So, you know, those, those people who look at Myra stars and they go from maximum to minimum in a couple of years, this is, this is for the impatient. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's not just stars that vary. We have variable nebulae, and the BAA has got a, a program to look at these, and the winter sky is a, is a good time to look at them because many of them are visible in the winter sky. And here are just a couple of examples of those. One of them is uh, Hubble's variable nebula, NGC 2261, this really nice Richard Sargent uh, animation here showing some variation in the, the nebula here. So one of the key things with these is processing the images so that you actually are seeing real changes and not changes due to your um, processing. And then the one on the right is Garbadagian's nebula, uh, where I've, I've got two images here, one taken in 2017 when the nebula was visible very, very well, and one taken now when it's pretty much disappeared. Um, so variable nebulae, definitely worth watching. Um, they're good imaging targets, but when you do image them, try and make sure that you, you use the same kind of uh, parameters, exposure parameters, gain parameters, and all the other parameters you use for processing, because it's very easy to make a nebula look different just by stretching it slightly differently. So you need to be careful not to do that. So comets, there are a few around. This one, in fact, Simon, could you just turn the lights down a little bit, please? Thank you. Um, so this is uh, Comet 29P, Schwarzman Vachman, which is a very large comet uh, that orbits around the distance of Jupiter. So it's in an almost circular orbit. Um, it regularly seems to go into outbursts. And, and Richard Miles here is, runs a project for the BAA called Mission 29P to, to get observations of this. And since Richard's been running this project uh, with a large number of groups around the world, uh, we've, we've collected so much more data on this object than, than before. But this is an outburst that occurred somewhere between um, <clears throat> the 20th and the 22nd of November. The, the one with the line on it is where, what it looked like before the outburst, and then two days later, it had moved across the sky and gone into outburst and became much brighter. So on the left here, this shows the expanding coma that comes from almost a very, a very sudden injection of material uh, away from the comet. The coma is expanding here. Um, at a 150 meters a second, I think uh, we calculated from that. 
That's taken with, with a small telescope, that's with my telescope, a, a 0.28 meter telescope. The one on the right, though, was taken with a two meter telescope. So there's a group called Comet Chasers, which Richard is closely involved in, that uh, allows them access to the Fulks telescopes, which gives really ex exquisite data, so very high resolution data. You can see lots and lots of interesting features in that coma as it expands away. So anyone who's interested in joining that project, please just go on the BAA Comet Section webpage, have a look for Mission 29P, and it'll tell you the techniques you need to do to, to look for this. But it's a really exciting object to observe. This is the recent light curve that I've uh, taken off the webpage, just showing how many outbursts this comet has had um, over a very short period. It's, it's extremely active at the moment. If you want to know why it's active and what it does, call a Richard later, because he's probably one of the world experts on this, this object. A few other comments around. Uh, this one is, which one is this? This is 2020v2, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so this is a Peter Carson picture of 2020v2. But the one that we're probably all going to be interested in is this one. This is 2022e3, ZTF. The reason we're going to be interested in it is it's actually brightening quite rapidly and it may become a naked eye object from a dark site at the end of January or into February next year. It's going to be very well positioned for us. At the moment it's in Corona Borealis, moving slowly north in Corona, which makes it a morning object. But when it's at its closest to us, it'll be racing across the sky just underneath the pole of the sky. So right the way here through Ursa Minor into Camelopardalis and then into uh, Auriga. So really well, well placed for us. It may be possibly fifth magnitude. It will be quite diffuse, but it should be quite a good object. So spacecraft. I just wanted to show this. Uh, this is uh, from my Zenith camera. This looks up into the sky, looking for meteors and things. Pretty much everything that you see on this is a satellite in low Earth orbit. This is about an hour and 20 minutes compressed into 90 seconds. Now, if you think things are bad with Starlink, you need to look for a thing called Blue Walker. Blue Walker is a set of satellites that are intended to allow communication direct to your mobile phone. It has a huge antenna on it, and Blue Walker is likely to be very bright, and there are probably going to be quite a few of them. So. You know, Starlink is, is nothing compared to these. So, so watch out for Blue Walker. It is visible from here um, every now and again. It's kind of it gets to about first or second magnitude. Um, so it's a bright object. So this is the launch of the Space Launch System, uh, which I thought would never get off the ground, but it did. And it launched the Orion spacecraft to the moon. So. It's not received a huge amount of news coverage, but here is Orion with the moon in the background. It went into a distant retrograde orbit around the moon, and it's now on its way back on a pre-return trajectory. It's actually visible to us at the moment. So here's um, uh, Grant Privet's picture of it. You can see it moving in the image there between the two frames. Um, it's well placed for us to see. This is my time lapse of it I took the other night. And uh, Nigel Evans has also, also done one here. Uh, where is it? There it is, moving across the, the middle. So this is the Orion capsule falling back towards the Earth. It's interesting to, to observe it. I mean, not scientifically interesting, but just interesting to observe it. And what I've done is I've actually measured the position of this against the stars. So I've got some astrometry you can put that into a program and you can actually calculate the orbit. Um, so this is the, the current orbit of the Orion capsule and you can see on here it comes to a perigee of 6,536 kilometres on uh, the, the 11th of December of 1727. So the Earth's radius is 6,400. So that's saying this thing is coming to about 130 kilometres above the Earth. And it's, it's good to know that that actually lines up with when NASA expects it to come back and splash down. <laughs> <laughs> this time last year, we were all getting ready for the launch of James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, that launch went really well. 
The deployment went really well, and we ended up with an extraordinary telescope in Earth orbit, which has been sending back some incredible images. So this is one I really like. This is Stefan's Quintet, taken by JWST. Uh, download the original image, which is huge, and you can zoom in on different bits of it. And it just shows what an incredible instrument that is, the JWST. And so just incredibly relieved that it got there. I remember watching it on Christmas Day, um, at lunchtime Christmas Day, just watching the launch and just hoping that it got up there, and it did. Um, these are pretty impressive. These are images of Titan in different wavelengths. Um, some wavelengths can actually see the surface, so they can see the methane oceans on Titan. So my last section is about NEOs, fireballs, and meteors. So Simon talked about how important it is to know where near-Earth objects are. Um, you'll be pleased to know right at the end of this, I have my annual awards for the best scientific journalism that appeared on the Daily Mail website. <laughs> and I've kept that to the end, A, to keep you in suspense, but B, because it's related to NEOs. So let's start with this one. Um, ESA have just uh, set up a, a big um, website associated with tracking NEOs. And as part of the way of getting some publicity on that, they've chosen a particular asteroid, which is this one, 2015 RM35, as a target for what they're calling their Christmas asteroid. So this thing is about 14th magnitude. It's going to come fairly close to the Earth. It's not easily visible. Well, it's not visible. Well, it is visible, but it's very low declination at the moment. It's a, it's a southern hemisphere object. But after close approach on the 15th of December, it will actually be a northern hemisphere object. So they're asking for people to take images of it and submit them to this website. They can, they've got quite a useful um, sort of what's risky about asteroids. You know, how big is the Earth? Um, how, how close does an asteroid have to come to be, to be dangerous? Um, and, and they've got also a thing on here which actually says, you know, for a certain diameter of asteroid, this is the kind of da damage it would cause. So it's, a, it's worth going and having a look on that. And if you do get some images of this, send them to ESA, but send them to us as well. Um, it may surprise you to know that we have actually imaged six asteroids that have hit the Earth. So we've dis discovered them before they've hit the Earth. They've all been very, very small. And the most recent one of them is this one. 2022 WJ1, which was discovered on the morning of the 19th of November and actually came into the Earth's atmosphere over Toronto three hours after it was discovered. It was less than a metre in diameter, so not too much to worry about. But one of the really interesting things about it is that weather radar, which is designed to pick up raindrops, actually managed to pick up the falling meteorites from this fireball. So during the dark flight period, where the, the fireballs stopped ablating and the meteorites start falling to the ground, weather radar over Canada actually picked up radar returns from these things. Um, so people are looking for meteorites around about the, the shores of Lake Ontario. Probably quite a lot will have fallen into the lake, but there's quite a lot of ground area there. So people are hopeful that they'll find some meteorites from this object. And that will, I think, be the, only the... Out of the sixth, two fell in the sea. It'll be the fourth occasion when we've actually got meteorites from a, uh, an asteroid that was discovered when it was still in space. Of course, meteors don't drop things that are going to cause you any damage, but they are uh, very interesting things to observe. Um, Alex Pratt did this plot from our cameras in the UK for the Orionids, showing the kind of coverage that we've got over the UK. And there are two meteor showers coming up that are worth going out and observing or getting, making sure your cameras are clean to observe. The Geminids on December the 14th, uh, which is the best shower of the, the year, but unfortunately quite badly affected by the moon. Um, and the Quadrantids, which are also badly affected by the moon. So we've had a pretty bad run this year of meteor showers being affected by the moon. The good news is that the Perseids next August are pretty much at new moon, so we do get a good opportunity to see the Perseids then. Most meteor observing is now done using electronic cameras rather than people going outside and getting very cold looking at the sky. And uh, these, are the, these are really bright event that Peter Meadows picked up from Gallywood, about um, five miles south of me. 
And I had a camera running at that time, and there it is. It left a really nice uh, persistent train that was there for about 20, 25 seconds. There was another really bright event only a few days before, uh, which is this one you'll see in a minute, there, which, which broke up and again left a really nice persistent train. So pretty much all meteor observing now is done using cameras rather than people being outside. And I'm rather pleased about that because I picked up this one this morning. Uh, this was at uh, 3 a.m. this morning, a really nice bright meteor when the temperature according to my uh, met station outside was minus five. So I was nicely tucked up in bed whilst the cameras were doing the meteor observing for me. Um, and you get things like this. This is a, a plot of the detections from my cameras this morning saying that there was something like, uh, how many Geminids does it say? 10 Geminids, I think, on this one. Um, so I've got four cameras. I pick up lots of meteors, and hopefully we'll pick up quite a lot over the next few days as the Geminids come. Okay, so just to close, the awards for the best scientific journalism of 2022 always go to the Daily Mail online. I don't know why. <laughs> this is a good one, though. <clears throat> I'm not sure whether you're going to be able to spot the error. Potentially hazardous near Earth, okay, near Earth asteroid is spinning faster every year. <laughs> a potentially hazardous near Earth asteroid located 750 light years <laughs> from our planet. <laughs> Good, isn't it? <coughs> so <laughs> the other thing that I particularly don't like is that that media doesn't like using proper units. They don't use meters, kilometers, or even feet. They use the size of things, like the size of buses. Uh, and this is one, it's as big as the Burj Khalifa, which is that big thing in, uh, where is it? Abu Dhabi? Dubai. Dubai. Um, anyway, it's as big as that. <laughs> right, this is an even more impressive one. <laughs> I, think, I think the Daily Mail are having me on because a couple of years ago they did another one where they used a giraffe as the standard size of a near-Earth object. So I think somebody in the Daily Mail is doing this on purpose. <laughs> anyway, it's quite funny. <laughs> Um, but it's not just the Daily Mail. So I actually came across something the other day at work. I was looking through a, um, a review of satellite threats in near-Earth orbit, and somebody had written this. Space is also vast. The realm of useful orbit is estimated to have a volume of some 24 million million cubic miles. Has anyone got any idea what that means? <laughs> uh, this, this was... Uh, yeah, probably, but but it's just it's just a really bizarre thing. And this was supposedly in a in a sort of professional report on the threat of near Earth or a threat of low Earth orbit satellites to uh, to us <coughs> on the Earth and other orbiting objects. So no, it's not quite in the the 750 million light years away near Earth objects, but it's uh, it's bizarre stuff. So anyway. Uh, Anyone comes across any of these things, please send them to me because I collect them to use in the Christmas meeting and hopefully. Uh, I'd like to do, find some from something that wasn't the Daily Mail online, but they do seem to be a very, very uh, good source of these things. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And um, if, for those of you who are coming to the Astronomer Pub, we can continue the conversation there. Have a very, very happy Christmas and a prosperous new year. And hopefully see you all back here sometime. Well, it's end of January, I think, our next meeting is. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Nick, for a compendious discussion of uh, what's in the sky, uh, as usual. Fantastic. Thank you, David. So, uh, yes, uh, many of us will be going off to the Astronomer Pub. If you are going, you'll have had a little card which will entitle you to a drink, and it will, on the back of the card, it explains how to get there, but you just go around, you just go around the circle line. Uh, I will uh, close this meeting now, keep observing, keep warm, and uh, remember to report what you've seen in giraffe units. So. <laughs>